every once in a while, there's like this blank white piece of paper. It's like like a blank page that shows up in my head where I'm just like, ah, oh, it's so empty in there. There's really, there's nothing in there except me saying things about there being nothing in there. Are we ready for a show? Uh, I'm just going to wait for someone in the chat room to say they can see us because I'm not confident with my skills. And then we can start. We're rocking and rolling. I think we're good. I think we're good. I just want Are someone recording? in the chat room to say it's working. I <laughs> I can't record it. Oh. Well, let's... Uh, okay, so let's <laughs> ask. Um, uh, hey, I did you four... Can I can't type today. Plurity, please. Plurity, please. <laughs> Plurity, please. Can you? Can you be recorded? Huzzah! We are. We are. We are live. Okay, so we can begin. All right, here we go. Ready? Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Once upon a time, the Earth was flat, and it sat unmoving at the center of the universe as the sun and stars whirled around it. You would have been a fool not to believe it. Our stars were the only stars laid out in patterns across the heavens, encrypted with ancient wisdom. Only fools thought otherwise. The winds that blew did so at the will of gods as were all elements of climate controlled by supernatural forces. Fools, of course, did not understand the workings of the unseen movers. People died, often not from diseases, but from vapors, evil spirits, curses put upon us by witches in neighboring villages. Or we died at the hand of gods for some committed slight, some failed performance of our duty, our ritual slaughter, our burnt offering, our purging of non-worshipping thoughts. A foolish thing indeed to make witches, spirits, and gods cross. At times, entire nations could be punished in the form of drought or other such natural disasters, leaving huge numbers of people wondering how they might better perfect the rituals of superstition in order to avoid such harsh consequences in the future. It never was this way, of course, but you would have been a fool not to believe it once upon a time, that today... You would be foolish to believe that which you would have been a fool not to believe once upon a time is a good example of either how long foolish beliefs have been fooling people or how far we have come as fools. Fools of history, unite this week in science. Coming up next. Now we're pretending there's music. How long do we do that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to sing it in my head. What's happening? <laughs> Something is happening. There's people dancing to no music. Scream. <laughs> Good science, Stu Blair. Happy day of science to you, Justin. Oh, I thank you. Welcome, uh, everyone, to this week's episode of This Week in Science, and we have an amazing show ahead on this week's show. We've got no Kirsten. I know. No it's Kirsten very sad. Either. We are without a Kirsten. We are without a doctorate today, but that's all right. Yeah. This is but, the... But you, you've got the, you've got a sciencey job. <sighs> yes, I do have a sciencey job. Yeah. It's, uh, it's new. It's sciencey, but it's new. Um. I have a bunch of science news to talk about today. Nice. I have the latest in pigeons and navigation, since that's a kind of reoccurring thing for me. Mm. Um, I have stuff about great white sharks in honor of my new job. I have sexual selection, as per usual. <laughs> I have the latest on the pig-chimpanzee hybrid thing. Also a little bit about dogs. And women, are they really the little icicles in bed that you think? <laughs> why, why are we going with my personal experience? Why would, you, why would it only be me that you would 
aim that question at. Right, yeah. It has nothing um, to do with the fact that you're the only person here with a Y chromosome or anything, but... Yeah. Uh, hey, look, uh, new, I've got tons of stuff. i got the uh, mm -hmm. Hobbit news. Hmm. New new news about the Hobbit. Uh, new brain charting stories. Uh, an ancient ape story. Quantum physics story. Neuroscientist story. A moon myth. Maybe hmm. unbusted story. Hmm. Awesome. You want to kick it off? Pick your favorite? Oh, pick my favorite. Which is the favorite? There's so many. Oh, you know, I'm going to go right to The Hobbit just because this is uh, awesome. going to recap for some of our older hobbity stories. Homo floriensis, mm -hmm. the little Indonesian person. Mm -hmm. There was quite a big argument about whether this was uh, island dwarfism, diseased right. person, some sort of advanced chimp, or a separate species of Homo, well, right, currently they're calling it Homo floriensis, so it's currently considered a cousin. A trio of researchers studying the skull bones of Homo floriensis have determined that its face was actually much closer to that of humans than apes. It's uh, going to be one of those things where they have to go back and look. If you look at the earlier artist renditions, creations of what Homo floriensis might have looked like, they stood up like skinny little humans but it had sort of apish features. Uh, but yeah, it looks like in their paper published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, the team describes the techniques they used to determine what the face of the ancient hominin would most likely have looked like based on the evidence. Hmm. So more human than we thought. They say it uh, clearly did not resemble apes. More, more specifically, hmm. chimps. They clearly had cheeks, which chimps do not. Next, after a careful analysis of the single whole skull that was discovered, uh, they verified the relationship between the bone and soft tissue, comparing them with human samples. This allowed them to draw a face, which was subsequently compared to nine other faces that have been generated from prior research of other hominins of roughly the same era, using geometric morphometrics. That led to further refinements of the face of the hobbit, which the team reports looks reasonably similar to modern humans. Wow. In conclusion, the team suggests that earlier efforts by others to create drawings of the Hobbit's face were inaccurate, likely due to misplaced assumptions about the nature of the little people. Some had suggested, they note, that the little hominins were wild creatures, or were missing, a missing link between humans and modern apes. New drawings support theories that suggest Homo floriensis was more likely a descendant of Homo erectus that underwent some island dwarfism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Yep. So far, so good. That's awesome. It's a step in the direction we thought it was going, right? So mm -hmm. the science is following the path we thought. That's always good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Well... It's still there's still some big questions. There's still actually a lot of big questions. Um, how they got out to that particular island where they mm -hmm. were found. Uh, right, because it was it was farther than one suppose, could swim. Well, well, so, you know, and maybe we'll get other climate data that'll, or other geologic data at some point that will sort of build a little bit more of a land bridge. I'm thinking they stepped on turtles. <laughs> they just. They just rode turtles across. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's still, I mean, there's still lots of figuring to be done here. Right. But uh, but the the fact that it's now looking much more human than ape uh, mm -hmm. is a big move towards the island dwarfism, uh, Homo erectus right. offshoot. Right, but there's still the question of how they got there. How they got out quite that far. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, mm. still work to be done, but you know, now we know we know where to look. We know there's something to right. look for and right. start figuring it. That's very interesting. Well, speaking of the origin of man. <laughs> oh no. Should we get into it right how away? Does this, how does this story? I don't know. I'm not sure how this is. This, this is a real thing. But so last week we talked about the chimp pig hybrid origin story for humans. Mm -hmm. You heard correct. Mm -hmm. Chimp-pig hybrid 
origin of humans. So there's this guy, Dr. Eugene McCarthy. He is a PhD geneticist. And he his career is in this in studying the hybridization of animals. Yeah. He is suggesting that human origins can be best explained by hybridization between pigs and chimpanzees. We talked about this la last week. It's largely questionable <laughs> because it is based all on morphological data. He's looking at things that the human that humans and these pigs have in common that are absent in chimpanzees now before we talk about that can I just remind everyone listening including perhaps the good doctor if he's listening that we don't think we came from chimps our understanding is that chimpanzees and humans have a common ancestor it doesn't matter what chimps have Chimps have nothing to do with where we came from. Hmm. Well, yes and no. I mean, if you look back at that ancient ancestor that we share with modern-day chimpanzees, you would say, wow, look, there's an ape, <laughs> right? You would say, you wouldn't say, you know, you would say this looks, very, it's, looks much more like a chimpanzee than modern man. And... and and it's not it's not that yeah we didn't evolve it's not like a chimp one day turned into a human being like aha now we are here humans with our you know superior whatever it was yeah it's evolution takes uh, millions of years blah 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 but and there's branches we'll, there's branches there's branches there's, but there's we're going to share a lot of mammals there's i would say almost almost no mammals that are the same as they were millions of years ago like yeah. there's a few animals out there that you can point to in the in the in the kingdom of animals and you can say this is pretty much the same as it was a million uh, several million years ago but mm -hmm. there's almost none and specifically I don't think there are really any mammals that are the same as they were millions of years ago so for you to say that chimpanzees and pigs made humans pigs and chimpanzees were not the same millions of years ago right so that's kind of an oversimplification. I'm hoping that's not what the doctor is saying. That's what all of these releases that we've been reading have been saying, but I'm hoping that's not what it's saying. Ultimately, the study from last week is saying that there's a bunch of morphological features seen in humans and pigs that are not seen in chimps. That includes multipyramidal kidney structure, presence of dermal melanocytes, melanoma, absence of primate baculum, the penis bone, they are not in humans, right? Surface lipid and carbohydrate composition of cell membranes, vocal cord structure, laryngeal sacs, all this stuff. They're, they're saying they're things that they see in pigs, they see in humans, they don't see in chimps. Mm -hmm. Which, if we were looking at a chimp from back around when we think humans happened, we were looking at something that looked like a chimp, and we saw that all this stuff was also missing in this chimp relative that is present in humans, I would say maybe we could talk about it. But not to mention that nine times out of ten, hybrids do not create viable offspring. And that's close hybrids. Those are hybrids that have a lot in common. But they, but then they can, though. So They can. It's just rare. Yeah. It's very, very, very rare. And to say that enough happened that would make enough of a genetic base to create all of humans is rough. So, right. So uh, I'm wondering. I'm wondering really what is going on here because he is saying pig and chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. One. Um, he is. That is apparently the claim. Uh, it is the idea that hybridization. Um, two s different species getting together and creating this hybrid can create rapid changes in morphology. So that's why right. you know right. the offspring I get that. Of the, would be so quick, and that's why it wouldn't have been from our ancestors. It would have actually this claim would have been you know somewhat modern history. Of course, we have other history showing evolution of the great ape that became. Uh, modern-day humans, so that's sort of odd that that's there if it didn't happen, you know, uh, really, really 
long time ago. The, the other thing is that's interesting here is this is a geneticist, mm -hmm. right? Oh, he's, he's not but he using genetics. In Yes, exactly. He specializes in hybrids, but he's saying, specializes in hybrids, not using genetics. You're exactly correct. Right. There's getting, still not genetic. been. How is this a story for two weeks, and there has not been a single DNA study on either of these species? Well, there have been. I mean, well, the, I well mean, I'm saying there hasn't in relation to this. There has there been already no, has. Well, actually, sorry, not. A, they don't need to do a study in relation to this. Well, what there's they can been look no at comparison. Is, they can look at yeah. They compare. You can that somebody did. They're, I mean, you know, it's not hard. They're already out there. Uh, the the DNA sequence of pigs, the DNA sequence of chimpanzees, they have <laughs> strikingly big differences. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're not. You know, when you have a hybrid, first of all, when you have two species that can create a hybrid offspring, they're usually very closely related. Right, like the zonkey born in Italy this week. Like a like a zonkey, mm -hmm. yeah. um, like a mule. Right. Like a liger, like a... And even then, those animals are sick and often don't live to reproduce mm -hmm. because they are so sick, because they don't have a proper pairing of chromosomes. Yeah, stuff it, gets a little... But, it's but like, we don't so need to rehash the whole thing. thing. That, yeah. It's, it's like, we know, we know why we're skeptical of this. That hasn't changed in the past week. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that there's some pushback. There's some people from the scientific community saying... Yeah that we are not going about our rejection of this hypothesis Properly. in a scientific fashion, right. which I can respect. I don't. Their issue yeah. is that there was considerable fallout from the very first story covering this theory, mm. but very little scientific attack has occurred. So the right. question is, this is really my question about this story, is it worth our time as a scientific community to mm. put in the time to refute these hypotheses, hypotheses that we think are erroneous and perhaps a waste of time to even refute? Is it worth the time to refute it? Or is our time spent better working on things that could be more productive? Okay. And I feel like we owe it to the scientific theory to do the DNA analysis in the com comparison of the three species and put this thing to bed. Whenever someone puts a theory forward in science, it is our duty as a scientific community to give it proper respect, no matter how silly it sounds. Because 20 years ago, what would have happened if someone walked into a lecture hall and said, dinosaurs are probably warm-blooded? Exactly. I think, I, and I agree with you. I think, I, I think if, it's, if this had come from <laughs> me, right? I wouldn't expect the scientific community to have have any sort of response. It would be completely irrelevant. But you have a geneticist, you have somebody who's, you know, earned the right to put forth uh, this this hypothesis from the field that they they're studying. Um, they put it forward in a very odd way, seeing as how they based their, you know, their their work in genetics and is presenting a study without any genetic evidence. Uh, but yeah, I think because it comes from the scientific fold, it needs to be looked at by scientific minds. It sort of forces them to acknowledge it. So basically, I feel like this is a good exercise. This is an mm -hmm. excellent exercise for us as a scientific community to do this story justice. The whole point of science is that no matter how ridiculous a hypothesis is that shows up is that if it's brought forward by a valued colleague we give it due diligence we give it due process we treat it like any other hypothesis because if science has taught us anything it's that often one of the weirder things that is brought forward one of the weird weirder theories often end up correct and even though I am 99.9999999% positive that this is a bunch of baloney, I would like to see the comparative analysis that indicates through the science that this is not probable. <laughs> I would like to see that on paper. As opposed to just saying, oh, this is silly, chimps and pigs, yeah, right, they made humans, whatever. Mm-hmm. Let's just do it. It can't take everybody that long. 
it's part of this being a part of a scientific community is peer review and looking at this stuff no matter how silly it sounds with the proper respect I don't know that's my two cents <laughs> no I, I agree how else do you battle this nonsense how do you battle the mm -hmm. The, the climate change deniers and mm -hmm. you know all of these other things that we can prove with science we have to combat all of these things with the same with the same tools with the same armament yes yes and we also must be prepared that if we take on this study and we apply research grants to it or spare time in the lab or you know comparative studies of studies that have already been done we compile this and we look at this with a rational rational open-minded scientific view and it turns out Stop. and it turns out <laughs> that we are not descended from an ancestor that we share with chimpanzees but in fact, chimpanzees and pigs, we should just accept it and move on. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Why? 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 If there's scientific evidence that says that's the way it is, then that's Because the way how it many is. times have we decided that dinosaurs are cold-blooded? Probably five that I can remember in my lifetime. Sure, They've done sure, studies but... that have said, yeah, dinosaurs are cold-blooded. And now, out of nowhere, oh, maybe not. Yeah, well, not out of nowhere. Out of re more research and more study and more looking at the evidence. And this is the wonderful thing about science and the way it works, though, right? Because we can write the book of science mm -hmm. that says this is the way things are. Dinosaurs are cold-blooded. That's right. Boom. It says here in the book of science. And then stuff happens. The observations are made. Challenges take place. Uh, new evidence comes forward. And the next edition of the Book of Science, you will open up and you go, see, it says right here, dinosaurs are most likely warm-blooded. Yeah. Although we used to think they were cold-blooded and some of them might have been still. But there's a great deal of evidence that they're warm. We can change this book. We can rewrite yeah. it. We can exactly. be... Exactly. If science said... No, really, the wonderful thing is, if science were to prove that we were some sort of chimpanzee <laughs> pig hybrid... It would be fine. That would be that would be really wild, you know. I think a lot more people would start eating kosher. <laughs> nice. It would be very nice. It All would right. be right. It would be a little like that's odd. Yeah, I don't think I people can go eat for the monkey bacon. in other countries. I don't think that's that weird. Anyway, anyway, you don't my think point it's being weird that people would eat a monkey. This is my statement. We wouldn't be as closely related to a monkey. I do not believe. We came from any sort of pig. I don't believe that. However, no. the claim must be given some respect enough to actually do the research rather than just saying, meh, nah. That's my whole point. Well, the other part of it, too, I think is I don't think the claim itself necessarily has to be countered with research. I think the first step in presenting, putting forward an idea like that is to yourself prove your evidence or show your evidence to some Well, but here's the thing, though. Peer reviewable. If you look at the first evolutionary phylogeny of all vertebrates, let's just say not even invertebrates, because that's a whole mm -hmm. other story. But if we just look at the first phylogeny that someone drew up of vertebrates, it mm -hmm. was all based on morphology, 100%. We did mm -hmm. not have DNA. And it was largely correct. Mm, yeah. There were lots of mistakes, mm -hmm. but overall, I would say they got a passing grade on that. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were correct. So I don't think morphology, morphological comparisons can just be tossed out the window. I think they're a starting place. You look at morphological distinction, and then you do the research that we have now. We use the technology that we currently have, which is DNA analysis and comparative DNA analysis. And so the next step should be, before this guy published his paper, I think you're exactly right, before this guy published his paper, maybe it was time to look at some DNA. Yeah. I completely agree with you. However, all I'm saying is that morphology is a good place to start, and I think that according to how we would like to, in a perfect world, 
world view the scientific community and the scientific method, we can't just throw it out the window. No matter how silly it sounds. <laughs> That's, that was my whole soapbox moment, point of bringing it up. Anyway, moving on. You want to talk about something a little lighter? Sure. Okay, so why are women colder than men? Why are women... I always thought they were warmer because they had an extra layer of fat. So, interesting you bring that up. Most people would say who have either shared a bed with a female who are male or females who have shared a bed with a male said that the male always says the females, especially their extremities, are always freezing and yeah. that the females always complain about being cold. It turns out that that's largely true. Mm -hmm. But there's a few interesting things to be brought up here. This all started actually with a retail scheme that they were making, REI was making sleeping bags and they were making temperature ratings for the sleeping bags and each sleeping bag it turned out had two different temperature lower limit temperature ratings one for standard women and one for standard men and there was science that went into that a standard man by their estimation is 25 years old 5 foot 8 and weighs 161 pounds a standard woman also 25 is assumed to be 5 3 and weigh 132 pounds now, just based on that, larger animals tend to gain and lose heat more slowly than smaller ones. So just by the fact that the females are smaller, they lose heat easier. Therefore, their temperature rating would be higher. The acceptable temperature range for the sleeping bag is what I mean by that, would be higher because they don't want to go as low because they would lose heat. Height and weight would directly relay to core body temperature and the way we experience warmth or cold. However, there's more variance than just height and weight. They also tend to have very different body compositions, which is what you were talking about. Women and men have different fat contents. And even though the average adult is 98.6 degrees, women tend to have higher body temperatures than men, starting. Therefore, they would experience colder temperatures more extremely, right? So women's mean body temperatures tend to be slightly warmer, about 0.3 degrees on average, than men. But it's because women in general have a higher fat content. For yeah, like their a body. whole extra layer of yeah. body fat than as men's do. Right. Muscle tend to be more on men. Sorry, everyone, it's science. And women have more fat. That's just, that is the science. And it's because these core organs you want to keep insulated. The baby maker needs to be insulated. Yeah. It's just the way it works. <laughs> so they perceive themselves as cold more readily than men because the muscle holds in heat better than fat. Well, fat holds in heat better than muscle. Sorry. No. Muscle is less sensitive to temperature change because, there we go, because fat holds heat better than muscle, if that makes sense. So that could also be body composition. But here's the third part. It turns out that women, their extremities are generally colder than men. Hmm. So, yeah. I'm trying to find the exact temperature. So, women, their, their extremity... Now, I think, now, doesn't, actually, the body, doesn't the body normally do that in order to, like you sort of said, <laughs> protect the baby maker? Um, to, exactly. No, that's exactly right? it. They're... they're all of the energy of keeping warm is going straight to the vital organs and the baby making organs. <laughs> so women have higher core temperatures than men, about 97.8 versus 97.4, but their hands were consistently colder. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, so they were 0.3 to 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at the core, but their hands were 2.8 degrees colder. 
That makes sense. Then. Because it's a redistribution of... Right, exactly, just, exactly. Yeah. And so bottom line, if your core temperature is warmer, you're experiencing the cold outside to be colder in relation to your core temperature, so that makes you feel colder. And secondly, mm -hmm. your hands and feet are always colder than the men's. So those two things combined, a different dif differential between how cold your, fit, your hands are versus your core, and then your core versus the outside, make all women feel frigid all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, Ed from Connecticut, I think, nails it. So, women stealing the blanket at night is justified by... Science. Yay! It's yes. true! I guess it is. Mm -hmm. All right. So, science turns out everything you yell at your girlfriend in the middle of the night, it's correct. Her hands and her feet are, in fact, icicles. Anyway. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. This week, it's with me, Blair, and Justin Jackson. We're missing Dr. Kiki this week, but that's fine. We'll get her back next week. We miss her, but we're making do, I think. Yep. Hey, do you have anything have, for me? Do we have time for, for that special time of the show called Blair's Animal Corner with Blair? Works yes. at an aquarium or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or like something. sharks and otters. No, I still like hippos. That will never and change. And hippos. It'll never like change. Hippos. Yeah. That will never change. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple quick animal things, since we talked so much about other things so far. I want to be succinct, if possible. <laughs> so first, I try not to talk about dogs too much, but I do have a story about dogs. There's this constant debate about whether or not dogs can see in color. The latest story says they in I fact I thought they could can. see. Wait, they can't. Well, I didn't. Can. I thought we already knew that. Like they could see some colors, mm -hmm. but like there's some colors, other colors they couldn't see. Or like, what was it? Like if you threw a green ball or a blue ball or what was it into the into grass, they could disappear. They couldn't see that color, but they could kind of see some other colors. You're yes, you're you're getting there. So the movie, TV, pop culture understanding is that dogs see in black and white. That, that is yeah, not true. Ancient old. They uh, have cones. Truth. We have I three kinds of cones. If some, if you're like me, some of your cones are deficient. <laughs> but dogs have two kinds of cones. So we can see in all three primary colors some of us, and dogs have two. They can see blues, greens, and yellows, but they can't really see reds or oranges. But they have no way of knowing unless you're inside a dog. If you can possess a dog and see what they see, it's very hard to be able to tell what exactly they see. So they did this really cool experiment. They saw if dogs could distinguish between colors or if it was, in fact, shades of gray, uh, brightness, essentially, that they were differentiating between. So they took dogs, and they had four different colored pieces of paper. They had light, light yellow, dark yellow, light blue, and dark blue. They taught them that certain colors meant there were treats. So they'd have two boxes. One of them had a color that meant it was a treat. One of them had a color that meant it wasn't a treat. Next, they took the same dogs that had been trained to respond to certain colors, and they placed pieces of paper with the color they had been taught to respond to in front of a feed box. They put another piece of paper that was brighter, but a different color, in front of another feed box. So, for example, if they were taught to respond to light blue, they hoped that they would respond to dark blue instead of light yellow. So exactly. light blue and dark blue look the same in black and white, but they're hoping they're going to recognize any blue versus a yellow. That means they can see some color. Mm-hmm. And they went for the color identifier rather than brightness almost all of the time. So they can awesome. definitely see color. And it took us how long to figure that out? I know! And it was just construction paper. That's all we needed this whole time. <laughs> this I find this that experiment really funny. could have been done mm -hmm. by fourth graders at home. Right. Pretty much. I mean, and how then, many dogs are there? in this country alone. It's just oh, ridiculously millions. insane amount of access millions. to dogs. And no mm -hmm. no citizen scientist was like, I bet my dog can see color. 
I'm going to prove it. I know. It seems odd to me, too, that no one would... I guess they were unable to effectively do some training with colors that could rule out all brightness indicators. Right. This is the first time that they felt like they could definitely succinctly say brightness had no indicator. Hmm. But yes, it seems like something very easy that we should have been doing by now. But I'm glad, I'm glad it was done. We know now dogs can see color. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> or as, as flying out in the chat room says, or they're just smelling the treats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming I'm experiment. assuming that they were taught that blue means treat, mm -hmm. and then they put treats in both boxes and saw where they went. Hopefully. That's what I'm assuming. But it is, you know, because that's a confounding variable, and these people yeah. are scientists. Come on. Yeah, but they're also Come Russian on. researchers, and they're, they're working with construction paper. It's. It's a tough All economy right. over there. Anyway, anyway. And then real quick, That's real, 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 like real, real quick. Really Peacocks. Yes, yes, yes. It wouldn't be Blair's Animal Corner without some sexual selection. Peacocks. We know that's the sexy sun hypothesis where it's runaway sexual selection also where a trait that might actually be a disadvantage in the world of survival in general actually helps with their sexual prowess because these giant tails that make it harder for them to flee predators actually improve their ability to get a mate. Their so what, Yes. Um, you want to say that again? Yeah, please. So the, the, their inability a to trait, escape prey. A trait that would make it, make it harder for them to escape prey mm -hmm. is actually helping them to get um, a, a mate. mate, and therefore because. be uh, be evolutionarily successful because they're passing on their genes. Is it because, hey, if we're hanging out and like a uh, fox comes, <laughs> no, uh, you're going to be able to get away before it's I will. The sexy I'm sun hypothesis. So basically, if there's already an understanding that the bigger your tail feathers, the better mm. chance you are of having babies. I want to mate with someone who has a bigger tail who has bigger tail feathers because they are more likely to have sons who have big tail feathers and therefore my sons will be more likely to pass on my genes. Mm -hmm. It's the runaway sexy son idea. It's the way it works. I want to have sexy sons so they pass on my DNA. Okay? Oh yeah. Yes. So this is my favorite thing though is I'm screen sharing right now. There's a picture of a peahen with a hat on. <laughs> They trained these peahens to wear these monitors on their heads so they could track head and eye movements to see exactly what it was about these giant tails that the peahens dug. Mm -hmm. And it turns out most people would assume that it is how tall they are or how bright they are, but they're really looking at width and they're looking at the size of the eyes on the tips of the feathers. Hmm. And what's really interesting is you would assume that it's about height because that's where they really go crazy, these peacocks, is in height. But the height, they think, they're hypothesizing, is so you can see them over high grass. Because in Asia, where they're from, and India, high grass. Lots of high grass. So you need to be able to see, oh, there's a peacock over there. Go over, check it out. Because they all hang out in leks. So they'll take a big grassy area and maybe 20 males will hang out where there's only five females. Then the females can go, mm, I want that one. And so they can see, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a peacock with a very big tail over there. They go over, they look at him, and their eyes, they're looking here. But the reason they got so big and crazy these tails is because these peahens are always on the lookout for predators. They're looking for tigers in every direction at all moments. So they need to be extraordinary enough to catch their attention. Hmm. Yeah. And that's what's so hard is because they're on the on the defense all the time, they don't have a great attention span. They're kind of ADD because they're always trying to watch their butt. And so they need to be so fantastic that they make them do a double take <laughs> and hold their attention for a second. 
So I think it's really cool. It all makes sense. It needs to be tall to, to be peeking over the grass. And it needs to be crazy wide enough to take up enough of their visional, like, vision scape. It needs to take up enough of the frame that they're looking at that it will catch their attention despite all of their distractions that they need to have. They need to have all these distractions to stay alive, but this needs to be big enough to divert their attention. Pretty cool. Guard, winning comment from the chat room. Excuse me, my eyes are down here. <laughs> Not up there. Down here, thank you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's my story in sexual selection. That's all I got. So, they do, they do put themselves at uh, greater risk, I guess, of always being, being able to be seen by a lion now. Yeah. That's oh, definitely. Rough. That's what I'm saying. That's why it's runaway sexual selection, and that's why mm -hmm. it's not. It's not at all about being sexy and being able to outlive others, as it is. You know, in a lot of other sexual selection cases, it's about being able to beat other males or being fit despite all these other things. These guys, they're actually getting caught by stuff all the time, <laughs> and. <laughs> It's not the most advantageous thing, but in the end, if it's getting them to perpetuate their DNA, that's the winning that's the winning hand as far as evolution goes. Yeah, it just proves once again that male will do absolutely anything. And it kind of even, proves, even you know the whole point even if of it existence. improves his chances of being eaten by a lion. Mm -hmm. Still willing to take the risk. I could remind you of plenty of stories I've brought up in the past. For our listeners, I won't, because they don't want me to. But I could bring up a lot of examples of where the males don't really care about themselves surviving. They care more about perpetuating DNA, and that's mm -hmm. what this is. Mm -hmm. But it may not be uh, completely up to us. It may be actually your, your women, womanly doing. Well, it is. It is. <laughs> I can't speak to humans, but as far as a lot of bird species go, and a lot of other species, <laughs> the no, females it's... are kind of picking where the evolutionary train goes. Yeah, well, it's also that uh, the X chromosome. Turns out uh, it's also largely influences in charge of... Um, sperm count and sexual right. drive in males. Well, and we talked last week about how the female's chemistry can actually decide whether you're having sons or daughters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the really, females are steering that evolution train. They're steering yeah, it. They kind of are in charge of the whole thing. We're just yeah. uh, here to do our part, our job, which is to mate and move on. That's really you're donating data. That's all you're doing. That's all we want to do, too. That's our That's program. True. So next time, the males are giving a data packet. Next time, you <laughs> gentlemen out there, players, uh, out there, you hear some woman say, all you want is sex. It's like, tell them yes. Tell them that yes. Yes, they that, just want to give that's the what how, some that's vital how I information. Born. That's how we, all of us males are born. That's what we do. Yeah. That's why we're here. That's true. It's just for sex. We would you wouldn't even need us, otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't spend any time with us. There are and some I species know. that have figured out how to not need males, like certain whiptail lizards. They're mm -hmm. all females. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm it happens. All right. Anyway, I think we're gonna take a break. <laughs> So we're going to pretend I'm going to play some music. <laughs> Are you doing like the whole, you got to do yeah. the commercials and the things? Yeah, I'm I good. can't hear you over the music. Sorry, I guess that's the actual outro music. Back in a few minutes with more This Week in Science. Coming up next. Go. If you're going to go, go. There you go. All right. So we're pretending we're listening to some music right now. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 different titles in a variety of genres. Twist has found many science-based books in the Audible library. 
You can start a free trial today and get any audiobook download for free and support Twist at the same time. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's audiblepodcast.com slash T-W-I-S. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist now for your free download. Twist also has some merchandise you might enjoy. Head over to twist.org to buy some of our swag. We now have a link on our website that goes directly to our Zazzle store. So go to twist.org and click on the Zazzle store link in the menu bar to start buying now. Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and fun things we try to do for the show. We appreciate any amount, $2, $5, $10, $100, a million dollars. You make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and have made the process easy by going to our page and putting donation buttons on each show page on our website, www.twist.org. So go to the website, listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, and make a donation. We thank you for your support. We couldn't do it without you. All right. Now we're waiting for Justin because that went super fast because I don't have any music. All right. So I'm going to pretend to dance. Yeah. Awkward. Yeah, saxophone, yeah. It's been a while. Plus I'm pretty sure I get some noise complaints from the neighbors. It's pretty loud. Okay. So, dead air, fun. Here we go. <laughs> okay, Justin, we're ready. <laughs> it was awkward because we had no music. Back with more this week in science. <laughs> all right, Justin, what do you have? I, don't, I, I, I told you all my stories already. Wait, no, wait, wait. No, here's another one. No, we just did that one. Hang on, let me get rid of that. Uh, we did that. Okay, so there's a research uh, University of Texas at Austin. Anthropologists Gabrielle A. Russo and Lisa Lisa Shapiro. They're looking at a 97 million year old ape from Italy. That uh, there was some original thinking perhaps this uh, walked on two legs, but they say no. Our findings offer new insight into the this debate. Well, it's certainly possible that Oreopithecus walked on two legs to some extent, as apes are known to employ short bouts of this activity. Increasing amount of anatomical evidence clearly demonstrates to them that it didn't do so habitually. So they did, again, it's a lot of morphology, but it's also morphology with some really good uh, ex- you know, uh, knowledge of how things actually work when they're all put together. According to the findings of the anatomy, of Oreopithecus lumbar vertebrae and sacrum is unlike that of humans, much more similar to apes, indicating that it is inc- uh, incompatible with the functional demands of walking upright as humans do. The lower spine of humans is highly specialized for habitual bipedalism and is therefore a key region for assessing whether this uniquely human form of locomotion was present in Oreopithecus. Uh, says Shapiro. Uh, previous debate on the locomotor behavior of Oreopithecus has focused on the anatomy of the limbs and pelvis, but no one had readdressed the controversial claim that its lower back was human-like, which apparently they're saying it was not. You know, it's kind of interesting, though. Um, so much concentration on the hip. It seems to me, and, you know, I'm sure this is evidentially covered in this. I didn't look into it. I wish I had ahead of this, um, but the, I always think that the more 
interesting aspect of the evolution of bipedalism would be the, the skull and mm, how the spine the... exits, whether mm, we're mm -hmm. out of the back of the skull. As, but once, once, this, once this skull allows for the weight of the head to be centered and to be coming out of the bottom sort of, of the skull, that's a clear sign that something has been spending a lot of time in bipedal mode because standing upright and then having to be like this is so awkward. So I think that I think that's further down the line. It comes later. I, it comes later yeah. before it. Uh, yeah, it's because I think there are lots I, of like more bipedal. Yeah, hunchety intermediates that are more like this. Yeah, and then it kind of moves back. Yeah, but I bet you there's a pretty good correlation to the amount of time well, spent definitely, being bipedal and the If you saw that, yes, 100% bipedalism, for sure. There's no question there. Um, I'm just not sure that you I think you're yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right because it's it's really it's very modern. Maybe it's yeah. um, I don't even know Homo erectus type uh, is about mm -hmm. when that's mm -hmm. really Becoming yeah, and I believe that's why they called it Homo erectus, is because of where the spine connected to the skull. Oh, no, that's not why. Well, that's one of the main that's reasons. <laughs> that is. Oh. I was the... <laughs> that took me way too long. Yes, it oh did. It took you... <laughs> I, I wasn't did it thinking my... that way at all. No, but that is that's one of the main reasons they called it Homo erectus, is because of where the spine connected to the skull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's got my feeling in for Kirsten, so it's perfect. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, here's this is a, this is a kiki story right okay. here. Okay. Oh, I'm excited. Neuroscientists show ability to plant false memories. This is uh by Anne Inception. Crafton. Sorry. <laughs> <On a> medical. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Do the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> The phenomenon of false memory has been well documented. In many court cases, defendants have been found guilty based on testimony from witnesses and victims who were sure of their recollections, but DNA evidence later overturned the conviction. You know, before we get into this, you know the the gorilla test? No. It's this observational test where um, it's it's old and it's probably on YouTube and stuff. And I should probably, if you haven't, gosh, I wish you could. I, you should probably go do it without me explaining it because I'm going to spoil it. Oh no, I think I've heard of it. Just remind me. So I'm so you sure. have you have people in yellow shirts and people in blue shirts and a bunch of basketballs and they're bouncing the basketballs back and forth, and you have to count how many times the basketball has been passed or this ball has been thrown. And so this is going on, and you're told ahead of time you're gonna it's like an IQ test. You gotta count how many times it goes back and forth. And so people are focused and focused and they count and usually they get it right or pretty close to right. You know, I was seventeen times or sixteen times, you know. <clears throat> then they're asked the uh, did you see a gorilla? What? What are you talking about? No. Okay. Play it again, don't count anything, look for a gorilla. Okay. You play it again and as the people are bouncing the basketball back and forth, somebody in a gorilla costume walks in, like, not, not subtly, just do 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 here I am, do 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 walks off. Nobody ever sees it the first time through. Well, not nobody. I saw it the first time through and still got the number right because I noticed the gorilla. And I thought, like, this is, I thought this is, like, a weird, like, is this really a real thing? And I've watched it with people. And, you know, done the setup and had them see it. And sure enough, most of the time, majority of the time, people never see the gorilla. And then, and then I think there's even another one where, where they have, it's like the same setup for people who already know about it. And they have the gorilla come in, but then there's also something else that walks through. And so they're like, did you see the gorilla? Yeah, I saw the gorilla. I saw the gorilla. Did you see the zebra? You're kidding me, right? There was a zebra. There was a zebra. You didn't even see it. Like, right? Like, there's like, even then when you're, when you're kind of, you think you know it, and you're now you're looking for it, you can still miss it. So what does that have to do with the 
Inception idea. <laughs> oh, the the um, false memories. Because right. even when you see something as obvious as a gorilla walking out, if it's not you, part of the if, memory. Right. If you're. But I think you know, omission is different than inserting. I'm not sure it is though. I'm not sure it is. I, and it and it has to do with concentration because because after the fact, you know, you could tell somebody that they're. There was, you know, there was a gorilla, and they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I must have seen that. Yeah, I must have seen the gorilla. And you find out there was a gorilla, you're like, yeah, I saw the gorilla. Of course I saw it. I was just playing along. Or I, of course I couldn't have missed that. So, I mean, people like to fill in stuff. And nobody testifies that they saw somebody doing something unless they got just enough information to fill in that. You know what I mean? But I do think, I just, I feel like that's different. I feel like... Seeing something and then not remembering it because you weren't observant right. is different from when you've seen the same picture of you dressed up on Halloween when you were two your entire life and you've developed a memory that doesn't exist. Okay. No, actually, I think you're right, too. I agree with you. I think there's it, fabrication, but I, I am not surprised at all because there's a lot of studies, there are psychological studies where... If you tell a lie enough times, it becomes true to you. Yes, and sometimes it's as quickly as three times. That, right. That's supposedly the magic base number. If you've heard something three times, you begin to believe it. Mm -hmm. Even if you need to hear it from three different sources, but those three different sources can be on the same talk show with the same agenda under the same, like, the, the that same writer. A lot. Yeah, no, it does. Okay, so in, in a step toward understanding how. Faulty memories arise. MIT neuroscientists have shown that they can plant false memories in the brains of mice. They also found that many of the neurological traces of these memories are identical in nature to those of authentic memories. Whether it's a false or genuine memory, the brain's neural mechanism underlying the recall of the memory is the same, says Sus uh, Susuma Tanag Tanagawa, the professor of biology, neuroscience, and senior author of a paper describing the findings in the edi uh, current edition, uh, today's edition of the uh, science, journal of science. The study also provides further evidence that memories are stored in networks of neurons that form memory traces for each experience we have. Neuroscientists have long sought the location of these memory traces, also called engrams, in the pair of studies Tonagawa and colleagues at MIT's Pickauer Institute of Learning and Memory showed that they could identify the cells that make up part of an engram for a specific memory and reactivate it using a technology called optogenics. Wow. Yeah, optogenetics. Yeah, they can. So now we've just gone from inception mm -hmm. to eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. <laughs> right? Seriously. These are two things that movies has actually predicted. <laughs> it looks like this This is very interesting, that this is actually something, based on the fact that they can actually identify specific areas of the brain, specific cells in the brain that hold specific memories, that's kind of frightening. Yeah. You know, and I mean, uh, Sunshine of the, what is it, the Spotless, what is it, what's it called? What's Eternal the movie? Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I, you know, I must have seen that movie once and had it removed from my memory because I can mm. never remember the title. But that's, that's like, that's such a fantastic, can you imagine being offered that service if you went to like. I wouldn't want it. Had a bad week in Las Vegas. Don't it's care. Like, you know what? Zap it, Doc. Zap that out of there. Or, 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 you know, in it, both dangerous, I mean, they're. In a way, you can think of almost a no more dangerous technology than this. In some ways, having it have a tremendous therapeutic uh, uh, value too. You Although, can think of oh, there's so many bad things that could happen. A bad person about to go on trial could kidnap somebody and implant a memory that is wrong, or omit an mm -hmm. emory that that indicates that they're guilty. That. Mm -hmm. This is we're getting back into science fiction. I always feel bad. We, when we, are, we venture is, into science fiction in this show. You know, this is this is <laughs> this is something extremely serious because then, right? The maybe ethics you work for a of company. memory tampering. What maybe is the ethics? For, if right, a bunch you, of it is fake anyway, what is the ethics of memory tampering? Right, right. And 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 how would you ever tell? 
yeah. that one was happening or the other. I mean, you, you you're talking somebody's working in a very classified uh, part of the government, maybe say for the NSA, uh, maybe working on projects that people would not like to have leaked out to the public. Upon each one of your projects that you complete, you go into the you know go in for a checkup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They shine a little light in your eyes. You're like, wow, hey, Oof. I feel a little fuzzy in the head, but uh, when are we going to start the project? Oh, you know what? We're not going to do that project after all. We got so another the project. It's black thing now. Good, right? Black Boom, pen. memory's gone. Yeah. And then in fo- implanting a false memory, yeah. then the chain of custody of anyone who is in captivity anywhere on this planet, I mean... You know, and who's to say, gosh, I mean... See, what I had really hoped was that you could see f- real memories came from this part of your brain yeah, right? and fake Here's memories came from this go. part of your brain. That's what I would have hoped. So you could then do a lie detector test that is real. You could do a lie detector test that is also a fake memory test. And you could tell right away, oh, this is coming from this part of your brain. This is a real thing that happened. Unfortunately, the human brain not so clear cut and what is real to you becomes real in your brain. So here we go. The last day, and last year study researchers conditioned mice to feel uh, to fear a particular chamber by delivering a mild electric shock. Hmm. As this memory was formed, the CFOS gene was turned on along with the engineered uh, they had an engineered gene that was inserted in there as well. This way, cells encoding the memory trace were labeled with a light-sensitive protein. They could actually see where the memory went. That's bizarre. It's wild. Next day, when the white mice were put in a different chamber they had never seen before, they behaved normally. However, when the researchers delivered a pulse of light to the hippocampus, stimulating the memory cells labeled with this channel, what do they call it? Channel R. Hudson. I love they called it channel. They're just turning on the brain channel. The mice froze in fear as the previous day memory was reactivated. Compared to most studies that treat the brain as a black box while trying to access it from the inside, this is like we're trying to study the brain from the inside out. The technology we developed for this study allows us to to find, dissect, and even potentially tinker with the memory process by directly controlling brain cells. Yeah. Hmm. So they can manipulate specific feelings. That was, yeah, that was the last within study, though. certain contexts. Right. To draw new conclusions, create new memories. Essentially. Well, this is the, this is oh, that. Yeah, they were bringing back an old memory in that one. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, new study exploring whether they could use these reactivated engrams to plant false memories in the mice's brain. Researchers placed the mice in a novel chamber A, but did not deliver any shocks. As the mice explored this chamber. Their memory cells were labeled with this uh, channel, channel Hudopsin. Next day, mice were placed in a second, very different chamber, B. After a while, the mice were given a mild foot shock. At the same instant, the researchers used light to activate the cells encoding for the memory of chamber A, the nice chamber where nothing had happened. On the third day, the mice were placed back into chamber A, where they now froze in fear. Even though they had never been shocked there, a false memory had been incepted. Incepted. The mice they used that word? Incepted. They just did. The mice feared the memory of Chamber A because when the shock was given in Chamber B, they were reliving the memory of being in Chamber A. Yeah, Moreover, yeah. that false memory appeared to compete with the genuine memory of Chamber B. These mice also froze in place in Chamber B, but not as much as mice that had received a shock in Chamber B without having a Chamber A memory activated. So they were still like, they were actually... Uh, I see, I see, I see. So, if I'm a mouse that Mm -hmm. got a shock in Chamber B and nothing Mm -hmm. else, I was really, really, really scared of Chamber B. However, if I was in Chamber B and I was my chamber A memories were activated and I got a shock, I was more afraid of chamber A than I was of chamber B. Right. Because you're more afraid of chamber A, I think. Because right. I associate because chamber like, A with the shock. Yeah. Then just I'm, I'm, I'm having this weird feeling in chamber B, like I should be scared here, but I'm not sure why. 
Yeah, it's but more chamber like A vu. is where it's <laughs> like in chamber. Yeah, exactly. Spooky deja vu. Ominous, like, like oh, an I ominous feel, I feeling. I think I've been here before. Yeah, mm. and I feel like it went bad. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's for real inception. Inception. Now that that's we can scary. reactivate and change the contents of memories in the brain, we can begin asking questions that were once in the realm of philosophy. Are there multiple conditions that lead to the formation of false memories? Can false memories for both pleasurable and aversive events uh, be artificially created? Uh, can false memories for both pleasure... Uh, uh, wait, what about false memories for more than just context? False memories for objects, food, or other mice? Mm, are there that's hard. Once seemingly sci-fi questions that can now be experimentally tackled. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so I think... Uh, this is a ethically borderline area to study, but science must go, and it will go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's it's kind of ominous. I, I kind of wish we weren't going there. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like we're going. Well, so everybody strap in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if this could... See, here's the other part of this, though. Here's, here's the good side, right? Because, of course... Yeah, you know, I I, did, I almost want my reaction, my gut reaction is almost to say, what is the difference between going in and physically implanting memories and ideas and concepts into people's minds versus a child being raised in a madras versus somebody who watches nothing but mm. network news versus somebody who's in a party or a religion, or in a community One that is has external a external stimuli. stimuli. One is right. external stimuli. One that is you external. Can stim- control. No, I mean to it's a certain child. extent, you can turn off the TV. You can run away from wherever you're living. There's some sort of situation where you're up you're to a in point and you're a point. in a place with stimuli. There's right. stimuli. up to a point. You can That's run away the from the supposedly. I mean, theoretically, you could run away from all anybody in a white lab coat. Yeah. But, I mean, but there's a certain part of like this is normal. This is what we do. We all go in for the brain scan thing, or we all go to church, or we all, you know, march on Washington whenever we want to change things in this particular way or that way. We're we're you were born a Trotskyite. That's you were born different a, from fiddling with your brain. Yeah. So, but it, but I still think it's fiddling with the brain, and I still think the mass media, talk radio, all this stuff that's out there, is fiddling with people's brains. They're just not doing it as efficiently. One. There's a difference the between other side of that. hanging out with someone with the flu and injecting yourself with the flu virus. That's all I'm saying. There is a yeah, difference. Yeah, one's a vaccine. Right. Okay, but... No. But the, here's the other side of this, though. Here's the other side. Think about the good things of uh, information communication. What if, instead of having to spend the ungodly amount of six, seven, eight years at university. What, I know Kung Fu? Is that what you're referring to? I know. (laughs) Maybe I do. (sighs) Right? Like the, yeah, like the I am anti all of this. I'm going on record. I am anti all of this. But if you could download the memory of having done these studies, you know. Nope. uh, Don't like it. Too easy. Boring. What is the point of the human experience? I was just telling someone today, I hope to live to be over 100. It would be a boring 100 years if I didn't have to work at all to gain any information. Hmm. Yeah, I'm no, anti. I, 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 I agree with you. All I right. agree with you. I like my organic human way of thinking. But I'm not sure it's right for everybody. I, mean, I think I it mean, is. I, I think it's the human condition, and I think everyone should man up. Right. If, I think so. I think you're right if they're going to be doing something that requires critical thinking. For those who've chosen something like, oh, that doesn't require critical thinking. I'm just a like, business. School. I think life Why? requires critical <laughs> thinking, Justin. Life requires critical thinking. I am anti all of this. I'm sorry. Do you have anything else? <laughs> just, I, it's just sometimes reading books takes too long. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> All right. What other stories do you have? Oh, let's see. What, what didn't we're we running do? out of times. Could Are we really? Are we? No, yeah. we're out. We We've don't, already we don't been going for an anymore. hour. We've already been going for an hour. Oh, here's a, uh, the moon myth. Let's get to this one. Okay. Uh, the people sometimes complain that they get worse sleep around full moons. 
This is a uh, scientist at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Do you have worse sleep around the full moon? Or? I have no idea when the full moon is, so I couldn't tell you. Oh, yeah, you're in San Francisco. You never even see the moon there. No. It's always foggy. I don't. Yeah. Uh-uh. Um, I've never noticed it, but you always hear, like, you know, correlative stuff that people are like, oh, yeah, like cops will be like, yeah, no, there's something about the full moon. Hospital rooms are always busy in the full moon. I think that stuff's been mm-hmm. That's roundly true, yeah. de- I th- I thought I'd been somewhat debunked, actually, but... Yes, yeah, so I've heard that. I've heard well, all of those heard myths that. Okay. is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, well, the, but basically they're saying here, research group uh, around Professor Christian Kajochin of the Psychiatric Hospital, University of Basel, analyzed the sleep of over 30 volunteers in two age groups in the lab. While they were sleeping, the scientists monitored their brain patterns, not something that Blair would let them do, knowing the stories that we discovered. I said monitoring is fine. I don't ah, like but they it. never know what they're going to do. Tinkering's not all... Okay, moving on. <laughs> scientists monitored the brain patterns, eye movements, measured their hormone secretions. Findings suggest that even today, despite the comfort of modern life, humans still respond to geophysical rhythms of the moon. Data showed that both the subjective and objective perception of the quality of sleep changed with the lunar cycles. Around the full moon, brain activity in the areas related to deep sleep dropped by 30%. People also took five minutes longer to fall asleep, and they overall slept for 20 minutes less. The volunteers felt as though their sleep had been poorer during full moon, and they showed lower levels of melatonin, a hormone mm. that regulates sleep and wake cycles. This is the first reliable evidence that lunar rhythm can modulate sleep structures in humans, Kajochin says. Uh, Relic from the past, according to the researchers, this circa lunar rhythm might be a relic from past times when the moon was responsible for synchronizing human behavior. This is well known for other animals, especially marine animals, where moonlight coordinates reproductive behavior. Today, other influences of modern life, such as electric light, masked the moon's influence on us. However, the study shows that in the controlled environment of the laboratory with a strict study protocol, the moon's hold over us can be made visible and measurable again. Wow. That's just lunacy. I'm, I'm, wow. All right, who did thunk? Uh, parts of it make sense. I mean, if we have circadian rhythms, why not? tidal rhythms, but at the same time, it seems weird. There is something to be said about the fact that female hormone cycles are probably on a similar period to tidal cycles. Mm -hmm. The two things might be confounding each other. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I've heard a lot of women... Probably um, not. Probably each woman is at a different point in that cycle in relation to the tides. I'm assuming they're not actually related, but... uh, It's amazing how much... But then also, one could say that if the hormones from that cycle affect sleep and mood, why not tidal rhythms? I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I'm skeptical, but open. Hmm. Because if you have circadian rhythms, what's the difference? Kinda, yeah. And we do have to remember that at one point in our history, we all lived someplace that wasn't foggy San Francisco, had no lights on at night, that the big show, if you were to stay up late at night, was the stars. And there was no bigger player in that night sky than the moon. Right, and, and that would moved, be the best time to changed. do things at night would be when the moon was up and full. Therefore, you wouldn't want to be asleep. Right, you couldn't read a book uh, unless there was a decent-sized moon out. Is that a <laughs> euphemism? Read a book. <laughs> Why is it, I wasn't even being... You're, you're pulling <laughs> euphemism out of thin air now, Blair. This is, no, come oh, on! No, I didn't... You couldn't why, read a book. <laughs> why would you? Why would you need moonlight, Blair? What? <laughs> is it? What? Of course you need moonlight. 
What? <laughs> Why Do I really you... have to explain it? You need yes, moonlight. You... Why would you need the moonlight? How are you going to make a selection in the dark? Hopefully you've made your selection already. No, no, no. No, this is... Not way back you're, when. You're talking around the tribal campfire or at night when, you know, we're not... We're, of course. Well, you okay. need the moonlight. Okay. Yeah, no, it would be helpful. It would be yeah. helpful. Yeah. Anywho. Uh, <laughs> sharks. <laughs> Sharks, uh, so they go a long time without eating when they're swimming across the ocean. Everyone assumed that they were working off of fat reserves, but it looks, in fact, like they're working off of oil in their livers. They looked at drift, which is when a shark or a fish or even a bird or a bat moves passively through a medium or a volume of something, if be it air or water. Mm. So you're going down and forward at the same time. And sharks depend on the oil in their liver for buoyancy. So they found that they were less and less buoyant as these journeys went on, meaning they were depleting their oil in their liver. And that's where they were getting all of their energy from. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And then my very last animal story... The latest on pigeons and navigation. It doesn't look like a magnetic field. It doesn't look some, like some sort of ingrained weird memory. They essentially have a GPS in their brain. They took pigeons. They fed them beforehand. They had a feed coop and a home coop. They fed some beforehand. They released them from the middle of nowhere. They went straight home. They didn't feed some. They starved some beforehand, released them. They went straight to the feed coop. Essentially, they have a map with multiple destinations on it in their head, and they know the best way there from anywhere. Hmm. They have a map, and pigeons are far smarter than we thought. Pretty cool. That's all I got. I think that does it for me, too. Great. So, on ne next week's show... Again, we'll be on Google+. Plus This time, Kiki will be joining us again. We'll be using our on-air Hangouts. We will also broadcast live to YouTube, youtube.com slash thisweekinscience. You'll also be able to find us by following us on all social media, Google+, Plus, Kiki Sanford on Google+, Plus, uh, and from now on, also YouTube channel, everything else, <laughs> etc. Etc., etc. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in the iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can Google Twist for Droid. Or in the iPhone market thingy, it's simply Twist, <laughs> T-W-I-S. <laughs> for more information on anything you've heard today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at thisweekinscience.com, or Blair Baz at twist.org. Uh, you can also contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, or at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a memory that you have that you wish that you didn't, please let us know. Um, and be sure to put TWIS twist in the subject line of our emails so that we don't spam filter you into another world. We'll be back next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... <gasps> it's all in your head. And I'll be right back. Are we, are we, what, are we dancing? Wait, is there music? Where did she go? I think she had to go pee. Maybe that's why she had to run so fast. Hello, chat room. I guess it's just it's just you and me now. There's no one else here. All right, questions from the audience. Uh, anybody who's in the chat room there, uh, ask ask any question and I will answer it. Any question whatsoever, uh, be it about your own personal life, 
Uh, future, I can predict the future, I can tell you things that happened in the past of which there is no evidence. Uh, ask me anything. Let's see, have you, have any seen Naked and Afraid on Discovery Channel? No, I haven't seen Naked and Afraid and I don't think I'm going to see that. Something about watching naked people Hi. run around, like modern humans run around naked trying to be, you know, live like the ancestors and survivor. I'm animals. sorry, what are you talking about? I'm talking about watching um, naked people on Discovery Channel try to learn how to forage food or it's sort of like a survivor show or whatever. Like it's called Naked and Afraid and they take some I think people who have some survivalist skills and they put them out in the middle of somewhere awful without any clothes and they're like, okay, go survive. And then they with the film crew. I think that's what the show is. It's weird that they're naked. Is that really necessary? Um, no, but it's in the title. It's called Naked and Afraid. I think that's weird. I, I, I think, I don't know. I think that's weird. When will Jack Feedback be a netcast? You know what I, I would really love to do? Has anybody... Did anybody you know, someone's me? never asked me to be on Jack Feedback. I haven't. They've only done one episode. It was like five years ago. It's like, I need people <laughs> in a place to record. But I'll send you a script. I'll have you do some lines. Oh, good. Um, so, so uh, has anybody here seen... I think it was called Electric City. Tom Hanks's online, like, graphic storyline thing. Anybody see that? It's really interesting because it's really fascinating because it's basically, you know, it's all things. It's basically kind of like a radio play with, I don't even think it was animated. I think it was just still shots. I don't even think it was an animated series. But they would have a picture and then the time. Something like that. Eh, maybe I don't even remember what it was. But something like that I would love to do for a Jack Feedback. Uh, stills, a bunch of, you know, Comic booky stills with the radio play in the background would be awesome. Mm. Airspeed, velocity of an unladen swallow. <laughs> uh, I think this African is or European. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was. We need the clarification there before we can answer. Let's see. Oh, that's oils and fats are called lipids. I read that as oils and farts. I don't know why. Like, I, don't, I don't think farts are lipids. Yeah, it must be necessary to get people to watch that show for them to be naked. I think mm -hmm. that's... And I, I think agree. that's part of why... One thing I don't want to watch people doing while they're naked is... It's sort of like the episode of uh, Seinfeld where he's like dating the nudist girl, but then she's like doing stuff like changing a, fixing a bike chain or grunting while trying to open a jar of pickles. There's just like, there's, you know, there's stuff that yeah. doesn't translate. It doesn't, in combination with naked. Yeah, that's true. How you want to, you know. Mm hmm. I'm being naked all the time was also not, you know, there's nothing good about that. I don't, I don't want to go to the deli and have the person making my sandwich be naked. Right? That's not, yeah, I don't need everybody no. on television sitcoms. Have you ever seen the naked bike ride go through San Francisco? Because every time I see that, I just wince the whole time. <laughs> that <laughs> no, was I haven't. so painful. Hmm. Mm. I was just taking general questions from the audience, but I think there's a little bit of a lag because uh, between... The, there's a long la lag, yeah. Is there between the chat room and what, what's going on? Yeah, it's like almost a minute. I noticed that. Like, I started talking to the audience, and then they were like, yay, great show. And I was like, oh, are they asking me to leave? What yeah. happened? I thought we were friends. That's right. Episode one, 
they find beach trash, old cloth. First thing they try to do, I found, put clothes on. <laughs> uh, identity four, you know, don't need to involve me in that at all. That is over my head. The recordings uh, can go to Kiki. <laughs> yeah, put it in the Dropbox. Kiki will pull it up later. Awesomeness. Thank you, Identity. For Agreed. your awesomeness. What was that? That was a ukulele. Play some! Play some ukulele! <laughs> I need... You should have had that ready for the musical break. I you know. I should have been doing that. So did I just see up on the Facebooks a uh, a what? saxophone yeah. wielding? Yeah. The sax is my main yeah. instrument. Yeah. Well, I had no idea. Really? No. How would I know? How would I have an idea? Yeah. Saxophone. No idea. That's my main dealio. It's true. The berry sax. Is that like the low? Yeah, the enormous sax. one. Exactly. The one oh, that weighs I missed this good story. a million pounds. Scientists freeze light for an entire minute. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Mm, German Next science. Week? Yeah, definitely. Definitely bringing that next week. There's also another one of an entangled particle getting something happened. They did something with it. That made it so they could kind of see it and study it maybe in a macro level, which is really mm. going to get creepy, but that also happened this week. Wow, we finished the show in like record time. It was like an hour 15. Yeah. That's perfect. That's the fastest I think we've perfect. done a show. Perfect. Perfect. In years. Yeah. Years. Hold on one second. I almost dropped my ukulele. Where did you go? You're not in the... I'm right here. No, you're there. that's where you are. Yeah, but I'm looking for the other... I can't see the... Oh, the saxophone picture? Yeah. Oh, oh. Blair. From the days of extremely nerdy Blair. <laughs> What? Let me see. I I only oh, got a chance to glance yeah. at it. Oh. How, how is this extremely nerdy? Oh. Looks, well. Wow. I mean, this looks like it could have been taken yesterday. No, no. Rude. <laughs> Wait, what? No. No. How many years ago was this? Like three, four? It's a it's a fuzzy picture. I can't really tell. Why is it when I hear a ukulele, mm -hmm. I immediately expect to hear somebody singing in falsetto? Tiny Tim did that to you. It's Tiny Tim, but isn't it like, yeah. isn't that, I see yeah. that. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. <laughs> it was the worst singing voice ever. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage. But you'll look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm the worst. <laughs> no, it was, it was great. Okay, so you want to... Let me see. What? No, you want to be in a uh, Jack Feedback uh, story thing. Yeah, of yeah, course. Right. 
I love to act. Okay. I, I'm starting to think that I don't have to do this with a studio and people in the same room and all this nonsense. I could just I should just send people scripts. We will have microphones. Here's the thing. Um, like if you think about um, animated films, they're never in the same room. Yeah, but they still go to a studio. Uh, but still, but still, it doesn't have to be. Modern technology has gotten so much better than the original studios people went to anyway. That you could do it from home, what would have been impossible quality standards to have achieved 50 years ago in the greatest studio in the world. So, yeah, you should start doing that. I have too many projects, though. There's so many things that, like... Should be doing like I'm supposed to. Not supposed to be. And there's nothing I'm really supposed to be doing. There's a lot of things I'd like to be doing. There's a lot of things I should like to be doing. There's some things I shouldn't be doing that I shouldn't be doing. But most of the things that I'm doing are things that I really should be doing more of, but aren't doing enough of. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Like playing the ukulele. <laughs> You know what I should have done, and I didn't. I didn't think of this until later on in life. I should have been a Native American in California. I know, right? Like pretty recently, at least. Not. I wouldn't want to. Pre college. Pre college would be good. Pre college, but also like um, I wouldn't. Yeah, but also like within the last you know few decades, I wouldn't want to have been Native Nation in the history of California. Oh yeah, definitely not. Trail of Tears. No, thank you. No. Well, that wasn't here, but yeah, this is uh, we had the same. It was of, in the area. Yeah, uh, you know, the missions, the cowboys, the gold rush, the reservations. It's all really horrible stuff. Yeah, definitely not good. But I'd love to have that casino money. Cool, mm -hmm. that's so mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have that inheritance money. Where's my inheritance? Inheritance. Your parents are still alive. I know. What? I'm just saying in the future, it'd be nice. Or like grandparents. If my grandparents <laughs> were really rich, that would have been Oh, cool. yeah. No, I know. I know. Yeah, no, but my ancestors didn't work hard either. Or, is, you know. or. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it. Never mind. What? Go ahead. Just if I could come into money in some way that it wouldn't have ruined my work ethic. That would have been nice. If you'd come into money in some way that wouldn't ruin your work ethic. That's correct. Yeah, well, no, I would still totally do... Wait, what? <laughs> like, if you were raised with money, Yeah. a lot of the time that makes people mm. kind of lackluster about life in general and they don't work very hard in school and, like, a lot of the stereotypes for extremely rich children. Mm -hmm. I don't want any of that. I like I really liked having to do things for myself growing up because it's it builds really good character and it, you know, it gives you a work ethic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know what? That's also an argument for never being uh, wealthy enough to do the things you really want to do because Blair really by that logic, maybe the Blair 20 years of, you know, near poverty, suffering from now, we'll have a perspective of, hey, really glad no. the last 20 years. No. Because I you know what's it. coming. Oh, hopefully nobody ever thinks like that. Hopefully soon I will want to procreate, and it'd be nice to have money to take care of them. Hmm. You don't need money to take care of kids, but I tell you what money mm, does. Do. It's helpful. Money doesn't buy you any kind of happiness in this world or security. I know that. But what it, it does do. It buys convenience. No, it doesn't even buy convenience. It pays off misery. It pays off annoying, little, grinding miseries uh, better than anything else can. And that's what you really get with money. It's not the things you can buy with money. It's the things you can pay to... Yeah? Oh, annoying, trouble, a uh, little bit of misery, headaches. Uh, yeah, here, take this and... Yeah. Bye. Sorry about that. Mm. Paid trouble to go away. Interesting. <laughs>
But time, time's the thing I need. I need more hours in a day. I need more days in a week. I need more months in a year, and I need them all not to require me to be at work. <laughs> like all those extra days that I just created. I need them not just to be more work hours. I need them to be creative project times. Hmm. Guest 13312 asks, what would the 2.5 billion people who live on less than $2 a day say? Well, I guarantee you they're not paying my rent because it wouldn't be mm. enough. So they're mm. living somewhere where there's less rent, for one. Wait, actually, it was Sarah Silverman uh, tweeted or Facebooked earlier today. It's like, stuck at an airport, it's cold, delayed. I know, starving children, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> there's starving children in the world, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, there's always a bigger, worse thing going on in this big world, you know. Absolutely. I'm not going to compare myself to people who have it worse off than me. That would just be cruel. Be like, hey, hey, Blair. Hey, Blair. Hey. What's it like mm. to have clean drinking water daily? Woohoo! High five! Not like those suckers that don't have it. No, that's not who you compare yourself to. You compare yourself to the people who've got more free time than you and are wasting it or not doing cool stuff with it. Yeah. Or, or you know. I don't, yeah, I don't really have... I, there's not a whole lot that money could buy by that I really want. Like, I'm not... Like the new car junkie, I'm not the expensive anything that you could buy out there that interest. You know, a little bit of land for a science island would be awesome, but mostly the thing I desire is time, the freedom to do creative stuff. That's that's what money means to me. Oh my goodness. I know the Royals named their baby George. Before the, uh, all I was saying was like anything but like George or Henry. We don't need a, another King Henry or another King George. Those two, we, you know. And I guess they wouldn't have done, they, James got ruled out. It couldn't have been King James because it would have been all like, you know, LeBron would have been like, I'm still like way more popular. And I'm not even like a real king. I don't understand why people care so much. Hmm? About the royal baby. I don't really get it. Like at the risk of offending people, I just I don't I don't understand the fascination. Like I understand why it's important. I understand why people think it's important. Important is different from this fascination, that this this like hysteria, like all over social media that oh my god Kate's in labor, I'm so excited well, really? <sighs> Yeah. If it was our president, I wouldn't even really care that much. If we had a female president and she was in labor, I'd be like, that's cool. I would cheer for a female president. I yeah. would be excited that we had a female president. I would not be excited that she got pregnant or that she was having a baby. Yeah. I, I think that'd be pretty exciting. It'd be the first, first baby. Hmm. Or, I know we've never had a president that was young enough. Yeah, we have. Just, um, but they didn't have a baby then. Kennedy, Kennedy was definitely young enough. I think Clinton was young enough, wasn't he? Still? No, no. Chelsea was old. I think that she was. He was an eight, uh, eight-year president, and I think she was only I don't know, nine or ten or something. I don't know. It didn't seem like she was that when they started. But you never, it's always misleading too, because it's like, wow, being coming president sure makes your hair turn gray. It's like, no, you, you, you win the office, you stop going to the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> using the Grecian formula, <laughs> gray away, uh, hair for men formula. You just don't need it anymore. Yeah. I'm the president, I'm supposed to have a little gray now. Yeah, Obama either stopped using it or he got a lot of hair real fast. <laughs> Gray hair. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, wow. 
So you're not interested in royal babies? Yeah, I am. I don't really get it either. I'm not a. I'm not a royal family watcher, any way, shape, or form. I guess they closed a lot of those uh, uh, gay. <laughs> what were they calling them? Gay rehabs. Huh. Across the country, we closed a, a lot of those like gay reform. Like, oh, the turn you straight things. Yeah, like there's a, there's a really? bunch of them closed, and there was apparently an apology by whatever, I think it was a Baptist religion thing. I'm going to look at see what's going on in the news. What do you want? Do you want world news? U.S. news? Entertainment news? What else would people look at if they're not looking at science news? Ooh! Wow, this is interesting. Paleontologists discovered dinosaur tail in northern Mexico. Wow, that's an amazing picture they've got on there. You can really see it. Other by all this other news looks so boring in comparison to just the stories we talked about. Mm. One social network has been created that only lets in happy people. No grumps allowed. Well, that's fine. I think that's how it should be. Yeah. Right. Um, U.S. News, according to Yahoo. Asiana crash families hire lawyers. O.J. Simpson gets a Nevada parole hearing. Wiener admits to sexting more women as poll shows his popularity has plummeted. Oh, Wiener. Wiener, 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 what have you done? Yeah, he can't stop. <sighs> He's not the smartest of men, I guess. Icky God, I think gay rehab is actually Wise legal in, here in California. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was it did become illegal. Leave fools rushing, but I can't help falling in love with you. <laughs> That's what Wiener says. <laughs> All the women that he's texting. Oh, boy. How does, how does this... How is this... I mean, I understand, like, at first... Like, the picture that we all saw, right? Yes. The bulge. Uh-huh. You're stupid. When your name is Wiener, how do you do that? That's what I don't understand. Like, no. Aren't you hyper vigilant your whole life about? But yeah, right. Like you're a politician. On top of that, your public service. But anyway, it, like it's it keeps happening to these older guys. It keeps happening to like. like you think they Brett can't cope, cope with the technology? You think that's it? 
Yeah, something like that. Like, oh, I'll just send it. Nobody will see it because they'll just delete it off the – like, whatever. Like, you think how, no. since, they, since they, like, grew up in the time when you could, like, pass a note and it was all right? Something. I, I don't know. Like, I have be, no idea. They, they grew up before the technical age that they, like, don't understand, like – Okay, I'm of this age of which we speak pretty uh, so much. Am I, so am I. So am I. I used I used pay phones, and I know that any right, text okay. I send, any picture I send, anything I put on the internet, it is public domain. It's there forever. I'm aware so, of that. So, and <laughs> you published that picture earlier, and so which one? Um, well, it's already the, it was in the paper. It was in the paper. But the paper th- doesn't. Nobody keeps the paper forever. Well, I bet if you went to the Lowell website, like there's some sort of archive. Okay, but so so like yeah. Like I, the, the picture of me in high school holding a, a hawk that was on the Examiner. You can still find on the internet, and that was before the Examiner went digital. Huh. Like it's there. That's what I'm saying. So the uh, this this we I can't stop talking about Wiener just for another second. So so he does he did he gets I don't know why he had to resign or give up campaigning before over this his marriage was in trouble yada yada. So then like then he decides to run again and announces that there's gonna be more photos probably out there. These ones are more explicit. I don't know why they didn't get released before apparently, but for more women. It's like, look, you've shown bad judgment. I think you've shown enough bad judgment that people don't want you representing their best interests because of your ability to show bad judgment. Mm-hmm. Now, people make mistakes. These things happen. There's probably no shortage of cheating or talking to some girl behind your wife's back in Washington. You know, we have a former governor who's running to be the comptroller now who admittedly was using prostitutes while clamp- clamping down on prostitution in New York City and is still running running for another office. Like, it seems like it's just like there's nobody else left. Well, but... But to do so digitally, <laughs> the texting thing too. On top of it, it's that on top of it, where you've just you've shown, just don't be in public office. It's just not you're going to be your deal. It's just not going to happen. And maybe it should, but you got to own it at that point. And then you just got to make it like your campaign slogan, you know, like on your just put the bulge next to your picture. When you think of when you think Wiener, vote for me. I don't know, like, I don't know how you own that. Uh, I think it just speaks. It's it speaks to the type of people that are in politics. Hmm. What do you think it says? It's so okay. So there's there's several things going on here is that because we have we have people who politics is their life that is their professional they are professional politicians they are in the public eye their entire life and it puts pressure on them that probably one could say at some sort of subconscious level makes them act out in a weird way I think first of all it's not fair that we have people that are in the public eye for their entire life for everything private and public before they become a politician but I think it all stems from the fact that we have professional politicians Mm -hmm. and in a perfect world politics wouldn't cost money to be a part of politics in a perfect world it'd be something like community service where you have you have a profession and you maybe take three or four years off to be in politics, and then you jump right back into your profession. Hmm. And you are you are campaigning based on who you are, not about how much money you can raise or about who, what uh, platform you're running in conjunction with. It's it'd be more of a proper representative of us as a whole if they were people who had jobs. Right. So here's here's one of the problems with that. 
The guy, and I'm going to defend the career politician here for a sec. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm a little bit, I, I would have agreed with you before I saw something happen like the Tea Party. To get to a specific political party, which, you know. But they make, represent a fringe percentage. Well, yeah, sure, sure. But here's, here's the thing, is they can get elected. They can get, a, they can get people elected. We've got a great grassroots effort, which is financed by uh, big oil. <laughs> kind of, it's a financed grassroots effort. But to have people who can come in and say and do some of the craziest things I've heard and seen people do in politics in a really long time, and then just be gone, just disappear back into the shadows, there's something about the career politician who's like, you know, I'm not going to stop in the middle. I'm not going to stop the president in the middle of his speech and yell out, liar. Okay, but because here's the goal. The reason I, those people succeeded, su had success, the reason they had success is because the career politicians are so vanilla. That's why. It's because for once there was someone out there in the political sphere who dared to be extreme. The problem is that the only extremists were coming from one side and that they were also, a lot of them happened to be kind of a little maladjusted. Yeah. But <laughs> the point being is that if we didn't have strictly career politicians, they wouldn't have been so successful. I feel like if there were real people being represented by real people in government, the Tea Party wouldn't have had the success that they did. Yeah. Yeah, something something really horrible, and I, I keep wondering if people are, you know, under the age of, I don't know what it, where the cutoff is. Under the age of thirty, maybe. Under the maybe under my age at all. Maybe even people who are a little bit older than me. Because I was, I was raised in a. Uh, my mother was like a lifetime employee almost of the Democratic Party. Hmm. Um, for, I mean, from is from the earliest days. I mean, I used to when I when I was sick from school, I went to the the Democratic headquarters in Sacramento. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's where I would hang out on my sick day. Is is, is there. And so, you know, and there was, I remember all the sort of political debates and the goings max, but I've never seen anything like what goes on now, where one side is pure obstructionist to the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to get rid of the filibusters, or they want, want when one's in and then they, the other one wins the election, now they want the filibuster to be easier to do. Right now they got the easiest. I mean, the filibustering too is it's, you just have to write it down. You don't have to stand up and keep That's talking for twenty-four hours. Stupid. I want. I want that back. I remember when. Uh, oh, when you had to actually stand and talk. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> and Senator Byrd was opposing uh, going into Iraq, and he was, I think, already a ninety-two-year-old man at the time, and he's pulling out things he's going to read. He's, old man handshaking is going on and he held that for like I don't know how how many hours but it was I tried to watch the whole thing just me this old man this 92 year old man is gonna stand and speak as a filibuster until everybody leaves this building At least I should do is tune into it on c-span <laughs> right. right but now they can just say yeah we're gonna we're filibustering yeah that's it now we're gonna go home play golf and now nothing passes no judge gets appointed, no whatever happens. You know. And it, it, there's, it's sort of there for, I kind of like that about our our system too, though. It's one of the things our founding fathers did brilliantly, which is they took great pains to make sure that the political system in the United States was inefficient, hard to change, mm -hmm. and difficult to agree upon change. Uh, it takes majorities, super majorities, to move legislation around. And it's partly for a reason. It's partly because they thought 
we don't want this to get co-opted. <laughs> we created a democracy, but as long as there's just enough people who are the rational or either rational or don't want to change, let's keep the change from happening. We'll create these three branches and split up their power in a ridiculous way that they all sort of get veto power over each other, but any of them can obstruct each other too. It's just going to be awesome. All right? So it's supposed to move slow and the like, but this is divisive. And it, the political arguments, man, at least, at least when I was growing up, they would try to appeal to some level of rationality. They would try to make some appeal to why their version of, you know, an economic bill or another was the way to go. But now it's just, it's, it's you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, like, the Jerry Springer show. Mm -hmm. and it just reminds me of, it's like, it's like a ghetto argument. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody's going to rip their shirt off and threaten to bitch slap somebody at any minute in Congress now. And it's not it's not the politics of you know debate. I feel like it's it's arguments. less that and it's more I'm rubber and you're glue. <laughs> it's like it's almost as if it was the I'm going to take my shirt off and punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. I could respect that more than what's actually happening. You know what? You know, I actually agree with you. You know what's funny is I think if, if they got rid of all the money in politics, if they got rid of the money immediately, you know what we would lose? 90% of the people who are currently in politics. <laughs> if we got rid of the money and the, the ability to influence, uh, you know, and pay back their your lobbyists, or even have lobbyists, I... I Guarantee we would lose so many politicians. Well, on, on, on both sides. Even. I mean, when Congress wants to pass things, they do. Mm -hmm. Like their raises. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was no problem. Or, you know, naming streets or any number of things like that. They pass them through five minutes. Done. Yeah. It's just, I really feel like It's it's what you were saying. If if people weren't in politics that were in other people's pockets, <sighs> yeah, I wonder. Though. I mean, I wonder if we would have on both know, sides. I'm not saying one side is right and one side is wrong. It's on no. both sides. It's, yeah. The system is too dominated on corporations, which now we've deemed have some rights as people, which I think is where yeah. a lot of our current problems are coming from. Is the fact that corporations have been given sometimes more rights than humans. Yeah, actually, Halliburton uh, apparently is going to jail. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, they pled guilty to criminally destroying evidence uh, during the BP investigation. Um, they're paying some sort of fine or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're go. not going to jail. They're not... Yeah, no. Hmm. It's a federal investigation, so it should be a federal crime. It would be a felony, which would mean nobody working for the corporation should be able to carry a weapon. Right. Right? Yeah, so if you're going to be given rights as people, you have to be punished like people, too. Yes! Yes! I totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Now, how do you separate? Well, the decision of one individual within our company can't be constructed as to be a opinion of the entire company or as a whole. I mean, yeah, no, I agree with you. Just because I had the impulse right then to run that red light doesn't mean I run every red light every day. No, no, it's totally different. No, it's it's uh, yeah. They should they should take uh they should take them off any future government projects as well. Mm -hmm. I should wow. no more no bid contracting to the evidence destroying gulf polluting bastards in Alberta. Bastards, I tell you. Anywho. Anywho. So yeah, no, I think I, I, it would be really interesting if we didn't have. We also have a lot of lawyers as politicians. You know, it's not like that's what you study before you go into politics. Apparently, is law. Yeah, which, definitely. Which kind of makes which, sense because you deal with a lot of law <laughs> in politics and government. 
It makes some sense except for the board. Except for what? When you're on the board for the environment or the board right. for other things that have nothing to do with law. Right, and, and, and it usually seems as though uh, they all have lawyers working for them. Like, couldn't you just have, like, a legal department? <laughs> Instead of, I mean, are all the, the decisions that are made based on law? No, of course their decisions aren't based on law. They're not judges. They're not looking at precedent. Man, I don't know why it is. Why aren't there more philosopher politicians or scientist politicians? Or there are, there's a good number of business politicians. I don't know. It's. I would really hope that the committees in Congress had some sort of relationship to what their committee is about, but they don't. The Committee for the Environment has a climate change denier on it. Mm -hmm. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least that opinion is being... It's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. But maybe that's part of it. Maybe this is part of what makes our country so fantastic, is that our political system is so inefficient that America shouldn't be able to radically change overnight. You know? Maybe that's part of the point. Yes. Shouldn't be able to rad radically change overnight. However, should be able to change in some ways, which it has in the past. It seems like a lot of things have come to a screeching halt recently. Mm -hmm. We were able to change a lot of things in the Constitution until now that helped us to move on as a country and progress. And when's the last time we had an amendment? It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. You don't want too many of those. You don't want No, to you don't, but week. you still need some. Or you need to, I don't know, get rid of some. Mm -hmm. As has happened. Yeah. Or, or, you know, I also, this is something, I don't know if they've passed since a law that forbids this, um, but I, you could, presidents had in the past the option to change the number of people in the Supreme Court. Like, this has been a presidential power. Mm -hmm. Why not just add a few? If you, every time you become president, don't wait for somebody to die, just add some more. Maybe or how about we try to make the Supreme Court somehow reflect the proportions in society. What do you mean? I don't know. You could look at certain things like socioeconomic status, gender, race. Nope. 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 Can't. Those are protected groups. That would be a good thing, though, to have. Those are protected groups. You reflected can't, within the Supreme you Court. Can, no. You cannot, you, cannot, uh, you cannot force somebody based on their their race or gender or religion or economic source of what's your thing to force them to become um, a member of the Supreme Court. Oh, of course you don't force. But it's something oh. you keep in mind when you're picking a new justice mm -hmm. is trying to somehow reflect these parameters that are in society mm -hmm. in America. Which we're slowly moving that way but not nearly as fast as I would have hoped. Yeah, that can be the taken to the extreme. The fact that the majority of the people deciding what is right and what is wrong in this country, the highest court in the land, is mostly white dudes. Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about it. Right. It's always been white dudes in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saying that's something that should be changing. Right. That's fine. White dudes are doing fine. Just leave the white dudes to do their thing, whatever they're doing over there. The white dudes I don't want these over. old, rich white dudes deciding what my civil liber liberties are. That's not something I want. Yeah, I know, I know. Old, well, not old my rich choice. white. So you'd be happy with old, rich white women? I understand. Well, that day may be coming soon. I'd be happier with some old, rich white men. Mm -hmm. Some old, rich white women. 
some I, Latino women, some I, black ooh, women. Uh, you know, I think you're prejudging. Some Asian men. I think you're prejudging. Um, the, some you poor know. folks, some rich folks, some no, middle class folks. I disagree. I so disagree with this. I so absolutely disagree with this. I actually think this is one of the things, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't. <laughs> right. i to make sure I'm being clear on what I'm actually saying here. I'm not saying that it matters uh, what the race is that any of these people are, but I think you definitely want, when you start to get into poor people, I start to worry, because then I'm like, well, are you talking about, like, uh, somebody who hasn't had an opportunity to go to college even? Or are you talking about See, like, that's the uneducated point. people? You need to fix this from the inside out. So you need to make sure people can go to college. Yeah, but if you okay. put somebody who didn't go to college on the Supreme Court, they're I never said like, that. Well, I didn't need I to get an that. education to become a lawyer. In fact, I... I never said that. I don't think you need an education. You just need... Uh, get the hoods to go out there and get yourself a, I'm saying to I the, think there is a pool that you can pick from to find judges that is a lot more diverse than what you see on the bench well let's see we've got um, uh, uh, women uh, how many women uh, well, we've got the the one the, the one Jewish woman and then the uh, one I think Christian woman the, the we, Latina? Or Latina, yeah, Latina, Catholic. Yeah, so we have two. We two seen. of nine are women. Do I need to remind you what the percentage of the population is that is female? Um, what is the percentage of the population that is female that's a lawyer over 50? Thank you. I uh, didn't say it needed to be a percentage <laughs> of the lawyers. I wait, wait a second. No, I think you there's need plenty. To... I'm saying there's plenty to pick from, and there's yeah, a lot course. more than two out of nine. Um, and we also we want judges because the things that they have to do are very judgy oriented. Uh, I think we have I think two of them are there's two uh, African Americans. Um, there's Clarence Thomas and uh, what's his name the uh, Scalia. Scalia's what? What? He's white. Scalia's white. Yeah. Oh. I thought he was African American or Indian. No, or he's the one that <sighs> I, he said some really offensive things recently. I thought he was, or he's at least like uh, he's like Indian though. Then I mean, he's like Sri Lankan or something, <sighs> isn't he? No, Scalia. I mean, that's I not a white so. people name. I just know he said some things that offended me to my core. <laughs> uh, anyway. But let's not get too political. That's not what this show is even about. What show? This is the after show. The after show is about absolutely everything. But Kiki I, hasn't been um, editing them, so this whole thing goes on YouTube. Oh, no. I offered for the, the chat room to ask us questions to launch Yeah, I know. This. The chat room hasn't asked anything. Yeah, they just stayed out of it. So then it, it turned into whatever talk. I mean, you're just like, I'm actually holding back because I'm... I, I so still want to go over the Egypt thing with you. No, we're not talking I, about that anymore. I can't believe you have a historical belief that's off limits. We can talk a, about it all you want off air. I don't want to get into it on air. Off, off air. How come off air on it? Okay, well, no, that's fair. You can have off air. You can have, but that uh, that actually. I don't want to have a, key, a heated conversation of it that won't be nature. Heated. Why would it be heated? We're talking about history. <laughs> How would we have a heated conversation about mm. ancient history? It's not even possible. It is. <sighs> anyway. So I won't talk about... Okay, Good. I will agree not to talk to you about history. Good. Science. Is that, is that all history? Because there's a lot of history. I mean, does I have to stay away from certain years of history? Or certain years in regions? This doesn't count as not talking about it. You're supposed to be not talking about it. I just want to make sure. I mean, because... History comes 
up in the show. The chat, chat room is politely telling me to shut up. Huh, what is this? Can you maybe pick up on the three parents' baby stuff from recently? Yeah. I'd love to know if and how two same-gender people could have offspring in a similar way. Oh. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I'm not sure what that's about. I don't know. I think there was a Kiki story. And I didn't... I haven't followed up on it, Insider. I'm sorry. I don't really remember that. Was that while I was gone? It may have been. I don't remember how it worked exactly. How they got three parents stuff up in the... Up in a baby. Mm. I'm not sure how you do that. History is written by the powerful, not always the most honest of people, says Zero Nero. It's not always written by the powerful. Um, sometimes it's written by literate desert people uh, who have spoken word stories to get passed on, and then, well, yeah, and then powerful people come along later and write it down. You're right. It does. But that's always part of the story, is who's writing the history. Gord, yeah, let it be. Isn't it's? I know, I know. It's just I've been. It's been a subject of. I Blair's not the person I need to talk to. What I really need to do is I need to go to like some skeptical kind of event and or some sort of like. Go find me some street preachers and like. Let them try to convince me of anything that they believe. I've got this anti-theistic mean streak that I haven't had. I used to live in a place that had occasionally opportunities to, like, there'd be street preachers or somebody I could go get bait, and I had this... This happened to me recently. This is why this is ticking me off. This is... I had somebody... Had You're making the, it a theistic thing when it's... It, to, to me, it has nothing to do with theism. Nothing. Which no, is no, why I'm, I'm sorry, saying I'm it's sorry. like... Yeah, it's just history. Yeah, it has nothing to do, I know, it's just, it's completely separate, it has nothing to do with the faith. I, I know this, this is, one is, no, you're cool with that, that thing not having, but the other one is, it would require something, a conversation that would be emotional on a historical belief system that I don't know where, how do you separate Imagine, <laughs> I don't want to talk about this really, but imagine that you have been told mm -hmm. and your parents have been told and your parents' mm -hmm. parents have been told about this story about how your family came to America okay. 300 years ago. Okay? Yeah. And all of a sudden, someone walks up to you mm -hmm. who is not related to you in any way, just walks right up to you and says, mm, we haven't found any proof that that's how you got here. How's that going to make you feel? Um, okay. That, to me, I was like, well, okay, so my great-great-grandfather, is it great-great-great? Yeah, great-great-grandfather, Giacomo, mm -hmm. uh, got caught by the monks in Palermo, Sicily. Uh, apparently, he was the sweep-up, the little church guy. He was like a little... 16 year old kid he got caught down in the basement cutting off a little slice of cheese and drinking a little of the monk wine he got banished from the city mm -hmm. 16 year old kid the church mm -hmm. told him you must leave this town right right so he did and he kept going and ended up in California or no I'm sorry uh, I don't think he started he landed directly in California but anyway he ended up in like he went he came through Ellis Island. He showed. He didn't up go. No, he wasn't Ellis Island. He might have come through like New Orleans or something. Okay, like fine. That. So uh, this is what you've been told. This is yes. what your parents have been told. This is your yeah. parents, 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 mm -hmm. parents, parents, parents have been told. Okay. Mm -hmm. You right. even have, let's say, somewhere in New Orleans, there's some mm -hmm. paperwork that says that you that your great 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 grandfather Jacmo was there. 
Yeah. And I go up to you and I say, well, I haven't found any of his belongings there. I haven't found any of his belongings in Italy. Right. I don't believe you. It didn't happen. Yeah. Right. And my opinion is, okay, this is what I've been told by my family, and the fact that you didn't find any evidence of great-grandpa Giacomo, you know, uh, it's pretty meaningless to me. So let me retell my story, okay? Uh, my great-great-grandpa and four million of his friends <laughs> left Palermo which had a population of less than that, got on a boat, all four million of them, came across the ocean, and all landed in New Orleans, which had a population less than four million, and then made their way to California altogether, a population of four million. And that's how come I live in California. Okay, how about and this? You say, and then somebody says... Yes, but we don't have evidence for 4 million people making that trip, which okay. would have depleted the entire population of Sicily, which would have made a major impact upon landing in the United States, and which would have left a, a highway of uh, footprints and evidences along their way making it to California, and yet we have no record of this. Okay, so let me, let me draw a similar parallel. Oh, and we came to work on the railroad... Uh, once we got to California, which oddly had already been built. So let me let me draw this parallel. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the 1930s, 1940s. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is said that a bunch of people left Europe. A bunch of Jews left Europe and came to Brazil. You can't find any paper trail because they all changed their names. They all got fake paperwork that brought them into Brazil as citizens there. And they all intermarried into the culture, assimilated, and now they're coming out and saying, actually, we come from Jewish ancestors, we fled during the Holocaust. But there's no paper trail, there's no evidence. Hundreds of thousands of people went to South America. Now they speak all the languages that they speak in South America. A lot of them converted to some form of Christianity, but now they're coming out and saying, we have this Jewish ancestry. But there is no paper trail, and in fact, there is paperwork that says that these people died in the Holocaust. Wow. Wow. Hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm that we have no record of moving to South America. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people? To those maybe 2,000 years from now, great, 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 great grandchildren. What do you say to them? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very interesting claim. Uh, very interesting. Because, in fact, I went to a seminar when I was living in Israel uh, from someone who, he's in his 80s, mm -hmm. and he still holds boxes and boxes of all these forged passports for people that he helped smuggle into South America. Sure. sure. And, and they could be sitting in there, they could have been lost in a flood, they could have gone down in a fire. And he is the sole owner of this paperwork that is any proof whatsoever of thousands of people coming into Brazil. And there are a bunch of people like him that have these one little pieces of paper that over thousands of years could disintegrate and go away. And these people have no record of ever having been in Europe or ever having moved to Brazil. Okay. So here's what I would say. Here's what I would say to this. Um, the, the, if we're making a, if we're sort of making the parallel, you would have to say that the people of Chile maintained that they came. From, I mean, this may be a true story. I guess it sounds like you're telling me a true story. But the equivalent would be if only the people of Chile believed that uh, people uh, in the, the, of this migration to Brazil. If only people in Chile believed that that's how we got to Brazil and mm -hmm. then we moved to Chile. But the people of Brazil, the Jews of Brazil or ancestors, but then they wouldn't be. See, that's, that's kind of the hard. This is, that's a little bit more difficult. The Jews of Brazil said, yeah, no, actually, 
major Jewish migration was 20 years before the war, or 20 years after the war, or whatever it is. Um, uh, the people in Chile have this belief, but nobody in Brazil believes this. See, because this is sort of the thing. There was the Exodus story, which is amazing because it became, and there's a reason why that story, I think, is so prevalent, is because it is the most effective philosophy, the sort of maintaining uh, values inside of a different, uh, regardless of what other culture you have to find yourself in, right? It's a very important philosophy, and I understand that. The kingdom of Judah didn't have that, and they were to the south. They had the border with Egypt. They had no such written version of this Exodus story. The kingdom of Israel to the north had it somehow, had developed this, even though they didn't, have, they didn't share the border, which was kind of odd. They were further north, they were further away from Egypt, but they had it. Part of the timeline of the thing is messed up because part of the slavery, the idea for the slavery in Egypt was that they were building pyramids, but the time frame, the pyramids would have been finished by over 300 years before the proposed time when they would have been there. It was written, it's at least that it's 600,000 families. If you figure that's maybe 2 million people, would have been, you know, like half the population of Egypt leaving all at once. The impact would it's just too it's too it's not like it was a few people or hundred thousand people on a boat who were intending to hide themselves in evidence. Uh, you know, it, it's not like they would have had any zero impact on this trip. And then so the migration thing happens, and then it's the kingdom further away has a story. The kingdom closer to Egypt doesn't have it. So it's not all groups. It's not all dispersed. Except then the story that it does start become part of Judah once Israel is invaded and they have to take refuge in Judah. Then, then the story eventually starts to arrive there as well and take hold. <clears throat> I don't know how, other than I kind of understand the... The, is the, the history of the Jewish people has never had its own land, so the story of being able to survive in a foreign land has been extremely important message across culture for you know whatever na country happened to be in. But the historical aspect of the story doesn't need to be true for that for that to exist, and it's. I also kind of think of it in context of, you know, there's no record of this in Egyptian history. So if you're an Egyptian... So there is, though. That's what I found. There is really? lots of Egyptian history and hieroglyphs from people that read hieroglyphs for a living. That is their job. Mm -hmm. That indicate a slave race. Specifically, there are things that indicate they were Judeans. Really? Yeah. Because this, this was the... I don't know when this was discovered, but this was the big revelation. Most, you know, historians had always assumed pyramids were built by slaves. But the more that they've uncovered, the more they discovered that this wasn't a slave culture. It was a non-slave culture. I mean, it was just it was highly organized. People had homes. People had their own. You know, there wasn't. There was no whips. There was no chains. There was no enslavement. It was a, a society that, you know, some people just worked in fields. Some people just worked these bakeries. They had this amazing ability to produce bread for really like the first time so they could feed a large population. It was very lush in resources. And it looks like the pyramids were built by people who were pyramid-building technicians. They were learning about math. They were learning trades. They were tradespeople. Uh, and not a culture of slaves. Now, there was a time when Egyptians uh, may have enslaved and had forced labor of uh, Israelites, Jew, kingdom of Judah, Israel, I'm not sure, the tribes, but, um, but it would have been uh, not in Egypt, uh, but somewhere uh, closer to where Jerusalem is today. And that could have been you know, the Exodus. 
I suppose. But it wouldn't. The time frames don't really match up too well. So I don't know. I haven't. I looked. I was looking for things that were show evidence, and I didn't. I didn't see. I didn't find it. I didn't see it being mostly. What I guess I was getting was debunking of the historical. Right. Time. Well, you you see what you're looking for. Ah, In both this... cases. Okay. Well, send me the link. I'll send you the link, and we'll. I think the bottom line is that you know in any oral tradition and anything that is thousands of years old, your facts are not going to be perfect. Yeah. No matter what. And what's important to me is that the Jews have been slaves before. They were slaves many times. They have been through many difficulties. They have been kicked out of many lands. And they've held many. They've held slaves too. I mean, it wasn't. That's the important thing, though, is that. Well. Is is for me as a Jewish person mm -hmm. and feeling a sense of tradition and a sense of kinship with my ancestors. What's important is making it through hardship and sustaining as a culture. Mm -hmm. That's what's important, and that's the story that's important, and. Whether or not every single fact of it is exactly accurate, I don't expect it to be. It's a 6,000-year-old story. Yeah. So what's important to me is that I get out of it what I want out of it. This isn't science. This isn't something that I can get in a time machine and see exactly what happened. I can't do DNA tests in a way that is going to tell me exactly what happened. No, no, and and but but part of the part of the problem I have with it. Oh no! Wait, I almost went away. Part of the problem I have with it is it's upon this journey, right, that the Ten Commandments happen. That man starts getting. And I'm saying I don't care about any of the theology involved. No, I know. I, I don't know. care because I don't have that part of me, and I believe. That there are parts of it that are faced, that are that are founded in historic incidents. In fact, they have found climate data. They have looked into things and found explanations for the plagues, for a lot of the plagues. That those things happened in a way that was interpreted and written down as a plague. There was a bloom in the Red Sea that caused it to turn red. There was an algae bloom or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was uh, a El Nino year, essentially, some sort of climate, advanced climate reversal, uh, like um, some seasonal change that caused a flare-up of locusts. Look at our cicadas that were supposed to show up and didn't, but they do sometimes. If you didn't understand where these cicadas were coming from, you'd think it was a plague from God right. to see millions, billions of cicadas all of a sudden out of nowhere. There are things that allow me to believe in my oral tradition. And I think that that's good enough. Do you think Until it, there's more information? Do you, do you think it trumps evidence? That's just what I'm curious. No, I'm Does saying it, there's not enough evidence. It's just like we said with the pig chimpanzee. We can choose to not believe it, but until we have proper evidence that proves that it is not... That, that it is oh, not... But we, we're, we're, we, have to wait, we have to prove the negatives. Right, no, have you have to, to prove the negative. That's what I'm saying. There is not enough evidence mm -hmm. that disproves this story right now okay. and there is all this oral tradition and I've decided to maintain my cultural traditions and believe in my oral tradition I have decided to do that based on the evidence that has been handed to me okay. I guess I, ha I don't have a whole lot to compare that to because I don't know what that's like there's and not honestly, a lot of societies and cultures that have an oral tradition that lasts thousands of thousands of years. There's not a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I definitely don't understand how 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 that works. I mean, 
Because even like the or the, the traditions that I have and I adhere to aren't ones that are actually expected to really believe a whole lot. You're not expected to take anything as literal. And I mean, I'm talking like Santa Claus, right? Like, I still do the whole Christmas thing, but I don't believe that, you know, I'll say it, I don't believe in Santa Claus. I just don't. It's not, and it's not okay. crucial to me doing Christmas or or giving delivering that to my children and letting them believe up until the point where they look at me and go, yeah, yeah, I know. It's like, okay, but shh, because there's a younger one, right? God, we got to be in on it for the younger one. Like, did okay, George but Washington hold on, Justin, actually... Justin, hold on, hold on, hold on. I hate, as so many Jews, I hate to do what we always do, which is bring it back to the Holocaust. But let me just say, this okay? Is why, this hold is on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. would not go there. Wait, that hold was... on. Simple thing, simple two-sentence thing. Mm. I don't want to turn this into a whole thing, I but... Millions of Jews died, mm -hmm. along with all of the evidence that they ever existed. Right. Okay, And right now, there's this massive effort to try to collect from every Jewish family in the world any information about anybody that, through oral tradition, we are told existed and perished in the Holocaust, so that we can r have this written down. But mm -hmm. if we didn't do that, if everything was left as it was left after World mm -hmm. War II, in 3,000 years, when we look back, you could very easily sit right there and say, well, we have no proof that the Holocaust ever happened. You could right. very easily say that. There is literally no evidence unless we maintain what we have. Well, so as long as... Well, there is evidence. I mean, no, there's no, a ton no, no, of evidence. No, no, no. I don't know. So you would have to make sure mm -hmm. that films don't degrade over the next 3,000 years, which in itself is a feat, all right? They degrade right. within 50 years. And then right. you have to make sure that every single of these 6 million Jews that died have some sort of paperwork mm -hmm. that has their name written down somewhere, which, as I said, they, only ha they don't even have, I think, half of them written down right now based on all of this research that they're doing, trying mm -hmm. to find all of these, uh, these family members' information. So you could very easily, if everything was left as it is today, yeah. in 3,000 years, you could look back and say, well, we have proof that 50,000 Jews dies, but, died, but we don't have proof that 6 million died. Right. So, so, so it's... <laughs> but, okay, so looking back in 3,000 years, we would have a world war. We would have news accounts. We would have books. We would have... A good amount. I mean, we would have preserved sites where things took place. Uh, we would have some sort of physical evidence. These these cities actually exist. We could we could narrow back the time when the World War actually took place, and see dates in different languages from different cultures and societies talking about this at some point in the historical record. <coughs> One of the things that makes me wonder, that makes me think. That there could be a reason, perhaps, for well, see now this isn't even probably a correct thought, but um, if you're uh, if you're an Egyptian who knows that there's no mention of the Exodus in your history, and now you're hearing about this Holocaust thing that happened in a far, far away place called Germany, why would you believe it? Because there's this story that your people were enslaving some other people, and there's no evidence that this ever took place. Why would you believe this other story? I mean, let's if we're gonna be if we're gonna be passionately pursuing truth in history, let's do it to its fullest. Why would we stop at at one incident that uh, that we want the world to never forget? And why would uh, something that never take pl took place or did take place? Why wouldn't you know? Why wouldn't we want the same level of clarity there? And it. it I don't understand. I mean, I understand. I do understand the religious argument for it. I don't understand anything other than a theistic argument for it because the theistic arguments are always if that's not true, if that didn't take place, it's not so much 
an oral tradition of living out of place in the world and overcoming a hardship in a historic time. It is almost a foundation story, the founding story that spread to three different religions that are blowing each other up, that are that are that are each one has wording and writing somewhere in it that says that if you don't take up this faith, that you should be killed. I mean, it's I don't think the Osama bin Ladens of the world are misreading the Quran. I don't think the God hates fags is misreading the Bible. I think these are the literal translations. I think this is I think the moderates of the world when they look at these texts and say, "Yeah, but I don't believe this." But they don't take the Sharpie and they don't black it out. They don't black it out of the Torah. You don't black it out of the Bible. Uh, homosexual is abomination and so is shellfish. And you know what? I eat shellfish, so the gay thing's probably not right either. I'm going to take the Sharpie. I'm going to cross that out. People don't do that. The moderates pick and choose what they believe and they don't believe about the religion. And they let the rest of it out there for the next person who's going to pick it up and take literal transition translation and say, ah, it says here that anyone that, oh, if a child, if a child mocketh a father or mother with a mocking eye, they, sh they should be brought to this town square and stoned to death. This is in our Old Testament, right? This is in there. If a child mock a parent, they should be stoned to death. <clears throat> I'm not saying this will happen in America based on the writings. But I don't know that that couldn't happen in some place that's just taken up the religion for the first time and is reading through the book and wanting to believe this, or somebody's using it for a political reason, or whatever. I think those. I think the extremist views out there are are the truer sense of what these religions stand for. So when when there's a, when something as essential as sort of the real beginning of what became religion can be to me has an opportunity to be challenged, I think it needs to be. Because I want nothing more than constant arguments to get rid of the foolishness of religion on this planet. Anything that I can show that the literal translations that people are using can be tossed aside and not employed anymore, the better. And that's a big one because in the midst of that, there's commandments that show up which presume that for the first time God has delivered the message to mankind that thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not this, that, and the other. They do a little backstory and they say that God has written in the hearts of man to already know this, but this is the first time it's really been delivered carved in stone. And one of the things that they that gets implied in this, I know you're not a very religious person, so you don't have these arguments that I have with very religious people, where they're telling me, well, how do you know right from wrong if not from God? How do you know love? It's altruism. Think... It's built into every right. biological society that exists. Mm -hmm. Those but, rules are there. I no no no. I'm not they a don't religious person. That. But they don't believe that. They I am, believe. I, I, am, I am interested in culture, and I am yeah. interested in tradition. Mm -hmm. I am not a religious person. So can you man maintain the tradition? And I don't really know Jewish culture that well. Is there any sort of... Do you have a tradition where you remember this particular event? <laughs> I can't help. You know. so, so it's not... It's not like you've heard it three times. or It's probably been more than three times. It's probably been told a lot of times. So it's going to be something that you're going to believe. It's, it's in, uh, an incepted memory. It's an incepted belief. Right? It's in there in a way that's not going to come out easily. So does it matter that if, it's, if, if it's in the historical record or not? No. It's a moralist story. However, there's still a country that's called Egypt. And there's a country that's called Israel. And they share a border. And it's not always, it's, it's not always calm <clears throat> on this border. And if one side still feels like, you know, they enslaved our people, and the other side 
you know, ha thinks, well, they're the kill reason. Kill all Jews, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> kill all Jews and see them driven to the sea. There's never going to be a good dialogue no. there, right? There's not. No. I mean, well, and it's, to, to be fair, to be fair, it's just the unfortunate plight of the Jewish people that they happen to have spawned a religion that spawned a religion that spawned Islam. That hates all Jews. It's, yeah, Islam's older than Christianity. What? No, 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 no. Islam's the, it's newer. It's much newer. It's like the young one. It's the new kid on the block. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like the youngest one. Because they, they, they're, yeah, Muhammad came after Jesus, and Jesus was like a son of God, prophet, or whatever. But that's why the, a lot of the sciencey stuff in, in, um, in the Quran is a little bit more accurate because they were using newer information and sort of that. But the, 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 uh, truly, the, the greater history of wisdom and poetry does lie with the Persian people than anything that was going on in Europe or the Middle East or anywhere else on the planet uh, for their time periods. However, Islam kind of ruined all that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just kill all Jews, it's call, kill all infidels. And, you know, just like the Catholics and the Protestants blowing each other up in Ireland, um, just uh, the most infidels, if you read your Bible properly with your interpretation that's been handed to your particular group of people, you can find the Islamists on the other side of town to also be infidels. That's why most of these bombings and terrorist attacks uh, are Muslim on Muslim crime. It's a religious civil war for which interpretation of infidel is going to be the one that gets killed the most. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. People need to stop. People absolutely need to stop with religion. It just need. it's just, this is like, this is a big, it's not, you know, you, Okay, whoa, whoa. But you're you talking about us us saying that, that, you know, you're talking about Jews not liking Egyptians because of the slavery out of Egypt story. But that would be like all Jews hating every German based on the fact that that's where Nazis were. And that's not how that works. Hmm. Because guess what? We don't have pharaohs anymore yeah. in Egypt. Uh, that's good. It's 100% different. Yeah, this is true. There is, there is, no, there is no grudge being held towards the country of Egypt based on that origin story. But do you know why Hitler was so successful in turning the German people against the Jewish people? Because the predominant religion was Lutheranism. It's Christian Lutherans. And Luther was a the most venomous anti-Semitic probably in history with the exception of a few popes. Right? So they were raised with Sunday sermons that was just religious, historical, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, stories about Jewish people, about the Jews, the history of the Jews. That in Lutheranism, Lutheranism is exceedingly, it came from this delusional uh, Martin Luther's mind, right? So when, when Hitler comes to power, he's not tapping into some brainchild he had or some beef he had with the... Jewish girl who wouldn't date him in high school that got all the German people wound up. He was tapping into the culture and religion that was being taught in Sunday school of false histories. Okay? And 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 to say that, yeah, no, it's not that, you know, the Jewish people hate Egyptians because of this, or Egyptian people all hate Jews because of that for any real experience they've had on the planet. But if the seed keeps getting planted, it's not that hard for a leader to come in and say, everything you heard in Sunday school, I'm reinforcing in a new way. Everything your Quran has taught you, uh, I'm going to use from this political end or that political end. It's death to America, or it's death to the Jews, or it's death to the Shia, or it's death to the Sunni, or it's death to my political opponent, who happens to be the same religion as me, but it, trust me, it's not going to 
you know, he's different because of this law of the Bible, which is, says that he's, he should be stoned to death or burned or whatever. So, so I don't think, I don't think, you know, I, I would look at what happened, the Holocaust, I would say that's not possible without, you know, Lutheran Christian soldiers marching forward to do what generation after generation after generation of their parents and their past, uh, the priests had reinforced ideologically within them. I don't think that's possible. And oddly, oddly, a man who, a cardinal who would one day become pope, used a, brought a document, uh, and you, I, I got I'm going to have to look this one up, but it was basically the same document used by the Vatican clearing land of Jews around the, what became the Vatican, larger area, where it was execution or conversion uh, of Jewish people. And almost verbatim, the same document was handed from a cardinal to Hitler. It didn't have to be presented to anybody, but if anybody had a spontaneous conversion to Christianity, the cardinal was like, you should pull them out of the line, basically. This cardinal later became pope. So, I mean, I would, if you're worried about anybody, the, I would look again to the Christianity I would look again to Islam, and I would look to the texts anywhere within any of these religions that's allowing anybody to have any belief that's not based on reality. And I would say it needs to get addressed. It doesn't seem like a big deal. It's definitely not a big deal to you. You're not going to form your opinion about somebody else. But you're also... When, whenever somebody really educated talks to me about religion, I always am in the back of my mind being like, yeah, but this isn't how it's getting taught. This isn't how it's getting, going to be taught in temple or in church or in a mosque. This isn't how it's getting presented by people who aren't taking an educated look at things. This isn't how it's going to be presented to them. This isn't how they're going to take it in as their own knowledge. And this isn't how somebody's going to pull that trigger within them politically when they want to motivate them to, uh, to do something. Uh, Christianity is 100 years older than Islam. Well, well, that means if... Okay, perfect. Thank that you. That means Zara. they're about the same, is what that yeah. means. Because you have no idea when they started writing things down in relation to when it actually started. No, we existing. do. No, we do. He's actually... Zero's got it right. I was about to question him, because I was going to say, well, you know, if Christianity is 100 years older, I hope you're not saying you're 2000, because that would make Islam older. But no, 500 to 600 AD, and you know, Christianity is like starts up around 300 AD, somewhere in there. Yeah, but see... <laughs> I could use the same argument that you've been using on me all night about that information. How do you know? You have no you have no proof of when people started and what is technically the start of a religion. Mm. And how do you know exactly when it started? And how do you know that, you know, there wasn't a text that was lost that was 300 years younger than that or older so, than that? So like, there are there are, yeah, absolutely. No, it's there, just... I don't believe any of that. I mean, I believe I believe that almost that a, a good chunk of the Bible is making it up. Obviously, it was edited by man. I mean, well, and the first time that it comes up in historical documents is not necessarily the first time it was a religion and had a following. No, absolutely not. Correct. Correct. In fact, uh, what is it? Uh, John the Baptist never mentioned Jesus. He was, you know, going around baptizing people and stuff. I mean, there's there's interesting characters in there. The first version of the crucifixion scene ends without uh, a resurrection. Oops! Oh, did we leave that? That's how we meant to end. So somebody else, many years, many many years later, adds adds a resurrection. But there wasn't a resurrection in the earlier documents of it. There's all these aspects, and you can. There's parts of it where you can tell where it's written, like. 
a lot of the Luke was written in Rome at the time, and that's when <clears throat> that's when they started changing. They got more specific with dates of when this or that happened. When they got more specific with the gory details of the crucifixion, you know, the further away from the event you got, the more detailed it got. You know, there's there's things you can look at you, that you can say this is written here, this was written there. You can find source documents. You can find lost documents. They found us. The Thomas Gospel it was found in I think Egypt actually, somewhere. You know, a huge bunch of and most of the source stuff, the original Christianity is like Jesus said this, Jesus said this, Jesus said this, Jesus said this, like in a long script, like no intricate uh, day by day stories, but what was they believe the Bible was largely built on, or the you know, Jesus story is a lot of the Jesus said this stuff that then got turned into stories. Not quite, uh, coincidentally, a lot of the story of Jesus uh, it's, uh, mimics the uh, story of Abraham, Osiris, 14 other people. Hercules even has storyline similarities to Jesus. Nothing about this story was particularly original. It had actually all been played out a few times um, in the past. But when presented you know, to a largely illiterate group of people in a time when you couldn't go to a library and look up a book, uh, here, here's sort of the way it, it, I always picture it, too. It's like this, is, this was my, why I was like hilarious in like seventh grade or sixth grade or whatever it was. Because I could stay up uh, late enough to watch Saturday Night Live. So I could go to school the next day, and I could tell all the jokes that I'd heard on Saturday Night Live, and not another kid I'd run into had been able to stay up late enough to watch it. And I feel like somehow there was access to just enough Greek tragedy, Greek history, uh, Thinian gods, stories of other gods of the past that had survived, that was in the hands of some, that they recreated the stories and ran the scenario and presented these jokes as their own original material. And it wasn't. It's all been, it's, uh, the entire story of Jesus, really, it's, it's been done so many times before. Every god back in those days, every prophet, man of God, or, you know, had, to, had to have a resurrection. They had to work a couple of miracles. And it's, there's even some indication if you're really if you if you like mystery stories, if you're a good mystery writer, you will present a story that by the time you reach the end of it, you have left enough clues along the way that when you discover who the killer is, the audience can look back at the evidence and clues you've given and go, oh yeah, I was a, I almost thought that it went that this is makes sense because you've laid the foundation for it, right? If you're writing, if you're a good reader of a mystery story, you look for those clues all the way along the way. And if you get them and there's an ending that doesn't make sense, it's like, oh, that's weird that they didn't give me any clues. And the there's a really interesting thing in the crucifixion story that feels to me like they were trying to give themselves an out. It's like, ah, should we have, should we kill the Jesus or should we not kill the Jesus? Because they do this thing where they have the, they have this on-the-spot conversion of one of the guards who, who's 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 there. He says, this this must this obviously is. Uh, a son of God, I can see this now. And then he goes up onto the cross and they crucify him. And uh, within a couple hours, they're like, yep, he's dead. The guard, the same guard who's like, this is a son of God, is sent to inspect. They're like, how are you sure he's dead? And he goes and looks. He's like, yep, he's definitely dead. A couple hours. Now, it used to take a couple of days for somebody to die from a crucifixion because he actually suffocates you, the way it works. To speed that up, you break the legs of somebody, so they're no longer holding up their weight with the nailed-in feet. And once their legs are broken, the weight sags down, the lungs compress, you can't breathe, you die. The two thieves or whatever, criminals, next to Jesus, had their legs broken to 
make them die quicker. But they didn't need to do that to Jesus. They didn't have to break his legs because he died within like a couple hours. And the person who confirmed it was the guard who had the conversion earlier in the story kind of and said, wow, this really is the Son of God. So, so, then, so then they bring Jesus down because he's dead and they take him away immediately to be buried in this cave. And in goes somebody with... Um, a, a couple of pounds of uh, salves of some sort, like aloe salves. Now these aren't embalming chemicals. These are healing, restoration, wound treating uh, things that are being brought in there. So if I'm reading this story and I don't know how it's supposed to end, immediately I'm thinking, hey, they brought him down, he survived, he's alive. And then when people come back and they see him, they're like, oh, I thought you were dead. He was like, yeah, yeah, here's my wound. You put your finger in there. Ah, yeah, no, 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 I was kidding. Don't actually do that. That was horrible. I can't believe you did that to me. So even if you read, even if you read literally, you can find things that are problematic with the storytelling. That there was so many authors involved in this story, so much of disagreement about the story they were trying to even tell. The Old Testament, I don't I don't know anything in the Old Testament, which that's not the whole book. That it's not the whole Torah. That's like one part of it, right? The Old Testament, it's the Torah. It's the whole thing? Yeah. Do you have other books, right? The Talmud is a discussion of the Torah. Okay. At least there's something else. Because the Torah that is that is there's some wicked, wicked shit in there. Okay, well, yes, I completely agree with you. Again, I am not mm -hmm. here no, to no, 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 defend no. religion. Yeah. However, also, when I have read things that were a direct translation from the original Hebrew, mm -hmm. it is often very different from the King James or, what is it, King Henry, no, all King the James different, the King James one. is the big one, but there's a couple yeah. other ones um, that are translated and uh, interpreted. Right. And if you read the different versions of the Bible, a lot of them are very different. And the stuff that I have read from the Torah, that is directly from the Torah, there's definitely nastiness. There's definitely stuff that, you know, ha is the re religion -y, gross, bad stuff. But there's, there's not all of the things that you think in there. You'd be there's not, there's not the There's not the mocking child should be slain. There's not the... Women are only on this earth to serve man because they are of man. Man is to serve God. God is here. To, uh, women are here to serve man. There's not. I mean, it goes on. There, there's. It could keep going. But here's the. Here's the thing, though. Uh, here's what I always. I, this is what. If religion just did this, I, it could be tolerable. But anytime religion accidentally drops something in our path, accidentally it falls. Some lunatic writer back in history got to insert this because of where he was in time and space and now it's there and it can't be moved it's like if we did this in science right well that's why religion has some flaws because it can't adapt it can't to new it can't parameters edit. it can't it take can't the adapt. sharpie I need a sharpie it can't take the sharpie and just say okay I know we know like this uh, this this whole thing with the uh, what is it is it Lot, Lot and his wife and the pillars and the, we're going to give our children over to be raped because we don't want the angels to we're just, this, we don't need to teach this to our children let's cross this out this is really there's no we've turned a wife to a pillar of salt because she was curious you know that's uh, we don't really let's curious get rid of the cat. <laughs> right, like I mean I get more I get more good moral information to my children through you know Never they're cried Aesop. wolf. They're or, right? Aesop type fables. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them. That's what it's about. Yeah, but th th those are okay. I mean, I mean it's all about how you interpret it. Like, much... like you could take a poem, and you mm -hmm. could take a poem, and from that you could say life is crap, or you could say enjoy the finer things. The exact same poem could tell you both things. Mm -hmm. The story of Job could be mm -hmm. about. Enduring punishment and th things are always going to be horrible and just deal with it, or it could be about optimism. 
Yeah. It could be like, about looking to tomorrow. Yeah. And it could be about withstanding extreme pain in the hope of good fortune. And it could or be it could about be, all of these things. You or know, it could be some wildly kinky story about a couple of daughters who just think they're, all of civilization's ended so that that same night they want to get their father drunk so they can have sex with him and get pregnant. An incestual thing. Like, there's better ways to tell stories. I was never here. This is why I didn't want to get in this conversation because I was never here to defend the Bible or religion. I'm not asking you to. I never, that would never, I didn't put you in that place. I didn't say you should defend it. What I'm saying is, wouldn't it, I think the, one of the founding fathers of our country did this. Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, uh, because he believed, yeah, there's some kind of God thing going on, but he edited his Bible. He acknowledged that the Bible was written by men. Our broadcast is going to be terminated soon. <laughs> that's fine. He acknowledged that the Bible was written by men and that he felt himself to be educated enough, worldly enough, understanding enough of the world that he could go through his Bible and edit him himself and correct mistakes of whoever had gotten a hold of it before. And basically what he did is he trimmed out page after page after page and boiled it down. Somewhere out there, I need to get a copy of the Jeffersonian Bible to see what's really left in there at the end of it. Ecclesiastes is good. I really like that book, actually. That's about... Uh, that's where the bird song, turn, 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 comes from. It's straight from Ecclesiastes. To everything. There is a season. Yeah, see, that's a good song. I'm not saying it's all bad, but I'm saying uh, what the, what is good might not fill two sides of an album. <laughs> like, like, I think we... I don't know why the modern modern era of humanity needs... Two, three, four thousand year old sheep herders to be our source of wisdom. It's sort of like people who think people with a Jamaican accent might actually have a better shot at being a psychic because they've got some sort of Jamaican accent that makes them seem more booty. I don't think the fact the fact that these ancients were half illiterate and and wrote horribly depressing, randomly violent stories that we have to really try really hard to find the wisdom in uh, should, should be standing the test of time at this point. I think we should have moved on at this point. I think it's... It, it, the world can do better than uh, Muhammad, Yahweh, Jesus, and, who, and, and whoever else we, you know... Moses, great Ten Commandments, I don't think was that shocking to people that at the time. I, I don't think God owns or it is the property or domain. I don't think we love our children only through some sort of divine intervention. And the fact that I think that religion says that, that the fact that I think religion tries to make that its domain and its territory... That is that that is showing the absolute tyranny uh, to which they will stoop to attempt to assert control over people's lives by making every aspect of it their domain, their control. That's actually a very materialistic view. According to their view, we are all just sort of empty shells, uh, completely meaningless and worthless, if not for uh, having faith in whatever nonsense voodoo that they're prescribing. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out and talking, Blair. <laughs> you look less happy than when we started. But yeah, well, if you recall, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> we didn't. I did. I, you didn't have to say anything. I would have just talked. Uh... I would have just gone on yeah, but I have to be here to broadcast. Oh, well, yeah, you, you could have just left the room. I would have just talked to the chat room. Uh-huh. Yeah. But no, but the historical thing still, I mean, because it, 
Is it necessary? Is it that necessary? That it be historically true? Because this is, I mean, I've had faith-based ideas before. I had a faith-based idea in the Higgs boson not existing. Right? It I exists. Didn't want, it didn't want it to exist because I believed something else was a better idea. And I found a Higgs boson. All right, time to move on. Is it is it important that it doesn't matter historically? Because you said both that it doesn't matter historically, and then the stuff that you found was historical. I believe it that it is founded in some historical fact. There are parts of it that are truth. That much I believe. I don't believe it's all truthful. Just like there are parts of the Bible, not all of it, but there are parts of the Bible that are based in things that actually happened, even if they are not true yeah. as they are written. Correct. Yeah. There's some. Uh, there so what's were important people, to me there were is I believe that the Jews were at one point, no matter how many of their them there were, they were slaves. Not 600,000 families, though. I don't care. Okay. I care that the Jews as a community were enslaved and that they moved on. How did they all end up in Egypt? I don't care where it was. <laughs> I don't care how many there but were. Is, right, right, right. But, this but is in a order to tell the story and continue the oral tradition, I have to have a story. Okay. And that is the story I've been handed, and that is the story I will continue to hand down. The point of it is that the Jewish people, as a community, were enslaved somewhere at some time, and they escaped. In one way or another, whether they escaped or whether they were allowed to move on or whether how well, happened, because they, they were had there. Learned about martyrs wrong they yet. were there. <laughs> they got out. They they survived. They continued as a people. Yeah. That's the importance to me. And I would like to believe that it's all true, but as with any story, any game of telephone, you know it's not going to be 100% true. But I don't have any facts to create a new story that is more accurate. So I'm going with the one I was given. And I don't think it hurts anybody, so I'm continuing with it. Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's particularly, uh, uh, maybe I don't understand if it is a particularly harmful view, but I don't see how it is. Um, I see, I, I can see why it's been such a prevalent uh, story to tell. Well, I mean, the slaves in the South used that story to help mm -hmm. get them through their experience. Yeah, right. And they... And it, it converted a lot of them to Catholicism, or Christianity of some sort, not Catholicism. Of some sort. Well, Christianity I have sort. no control over that, and that is like, you can't... Just because I ate a chocolate bar, that made me decide I really like chocolate, and then I gained 400 pounds, you can't blame the chocolate bar. <laughs> I... No, no, you can't blame the. Wait, can't yeah. blame the chocolate bar for gaining four hundred pounds from one chocolate bar. Yeah, that's a lot of. One story <laughs> about Jews in Egypt is not responsible for converting an entire group of people to a completely different religion. Oh, gotcha! No, 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 no absolutely, and and also, also oddly, it was because of. Uh, there's an, enough talk in the Bible about the right to maintain slaves. And, you know, uh, that, that, that it was used, the, Bibli the Bible was actually used to defend slavery um, in the South. They felt that they had a religious right to maintain sla slavery, uh, continue slavery in the South, because... You know, it says in the Bible, in the old schooly Torah one, that, you know, one should uh, love thy, or obey thy, thy slave owner out of fear of God. If, if they're good to you or if they're bad to you, you should still be nice to them. It's like that, you know, 
for people who had really endured a slavery to have things like that in their book, that's a very big juxtaposition for me. It's a huge juxtaposition. It's a big juxtaposition for me that African Americans in slavery would take on the religion of the enslavers and both can find things in the same book that says we can endure slavery and we should have every right to own slaves. That they could both be justified by the same book. It's just phenomenally must be a poorly written book that both sides can find themselves justified or empowered equally uh, by the same writing. Just, I just don't get it. Well, if you want to look at New Testament, the same writing says that you must love each person like you love yourself, but it also says that uh, you need to, you know, condemn certain people to hell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the hell talk so comes with the loving the Jesus. The hell talk comes mostly in the New Testament. Oh, yeah. Loving Jesus is all like, yeah, if it's good, love that neighbor. Um, but also Jesus does say that if people don't believe in the Lord in one true way, then bring him before me and they shall be slain. I mean, Jesus wasn't exactly... A lot of things he said were right. stocks hippies. Yeah, no. Um, but a lot of his stuff he said wasn't really original. I mean, the best thing from the Bible is some rabbi who I think wrote it outside of the Bible. Or I think it might be New Testament. The Golden Rule, the do unto others, that wasn't Jesus. That was a rabbi. Oh, definitely. But, you know, he did say, you know, he did say love thy neighbor. That is something that Jesus said. And but Moses told us not to. Uh -huh. Moses told us not to covet thy neighbor's wife. Covet is different from love. Wait, how? <laughs> like, I don't... I don't know what... See, this is the semantics of... This is why religion's so confusing, because it sounds like it's saying... But Go this ahead. is... See, this is why... I don't condone religion in general, but mm -hmm. religion is better when discussion is promoted. Yes. Which is yeah. one reason that um, I really... Ad I admire Judaism more than some others because so much of religious practice is devoted to intense debate about interpreting what the text means and what they're trying to teach you and all the different ways you could read it and how to take it into yourself. Mm -hmm. Is They spend hours and hours and hours talking about one page and what it could possibly mean and all the different ways it could be interpreted. Yeah, absolutely. And there's and other sects that spend a lot of time going, this is what the Bible says, take it as rote, move on. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And, and one thing I really appreciate about the Jewish tradition is that it produces some of the world's best atheists. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. It really does, because they don't typically ask in Catholic or Mormon Sunday school for you to delve too deep into the interpretation of the word. But they also yeah. allow for more gray areas in their religion. They allow for all definitions of being Jewish. They... Yeah, but as, yeah, you can't, general, you can't as a general rule, there there are extremists, just like any in religion. In any religion, there are. But extremists. I'm telling you, in see, any this religion. Is, uh, However, you can call yourself a Jew and yeah. study Torah every day. You can tell, call yourself a Jew and keep Shabbat and study Torah once a month. You can call yourself a Jew, not keep Shabbat, not be kosher, believe in God. You can call yourself a Jew and not believe in God. Yeah. But it's, you know, I, I don't really like talking about religion in general because I feel like, as a whole, religion these days causes a lot more problems than good. But that being said, you can't get away from it, and there are cultural ties. I have cultural ties. Mm -hmm. Just because Judaism has this weird thing where... 
In a lot of ways, it's an ethnicity and a religion. An or an ethnicity or a religion. And there's all these gray areas. So I call myself a Jew, but I'm an atheist. I, I call myself an anti-theist at this point, though. Mm -hmm. It's it because I, it's it really hasn't been. Uh, it, it's not just that I just don't believe and like move along. It's that I'm actually I'm I'm. It really irritates me when I see so many mo people being motivated so easily by these religious ideologies that are just. To me, I look at as absolute bullshit, and that's like I mean that's really where it, that's the sort of level where it hits me. It really hits me. It's like gosh, just, I can't believe people are subscribing to bullshit. It's the magnets around the neck that improve your performance as an athlete. It's the whatever nonsense of the new stupid thing people are doing. It's on the same level to me as as religion. I don't. And then the claims that are made when when you debate somebody like this, well, you know, the Big Bang. So I was I didn't have this conversation with you. I had this conversation on my other show, on the Meaningless Word show. But I had somebody come up to me and was at the car dealership, and they were they said they wanted to look at a car, but they were like, "We're not buying. We're really not buying." He's like, "I, I used to sell cars. I don't want anybody losing up. Just point me in the direction of the minivans. I just want to look in the window." I was like, you can't waste anybody's time. You were in this business. You know that you know, we spend a lot of time doing nothing, right? So I go and I show him the car. I do a full presentation. He's like, you know I'm not buying the car. I have no interest in buying this car right now. I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. It's fine. So he goes, you know, I don't usually do this, but you've been very helpful today. Bust out a billfold. And it's like hundred dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, and he gets down to a fifty, and he pulls it out. He goes, "This is for you." And it's it's not really from me. God wanted you to have that. Cool, <laughs> thanks. You sure you said a fifty? Because I could have heard there was a hundred. I saw a lot of hundred dollar bills. Are you sure you said the fifty? Because he had to go through, wasn't he? Saying just give him the give him the because he went. I didn't say that, but so he's like, I was I was Jewish and then I was an atheist and now I found Jesus Christ. Like, okay, it's, that's cool. Right on. He's like, yeah, and I've been very excited about it because I found scientific evidence for it. I found scientific evidence. I'm like, okay, now you actually have my attention. And we got into this conversation about theology and the, like, and he, the, the passage he found when translated properly and proper Hebrew uh, was that the something along the lines of everything in the world that is seen is made up of the unseen okay he goes yeah so Adams and I looked at the Bible that I was transcribing this from or the version of, and it was written in the 1600s 1600 and something or other, which is hundreds of 300 years before they discovered Adams I didn't I was like well there's like you know Cretius and you know, Plato's but, but, but proven in Einstein, but it was pre-existing. But never, I didn't get into that. I'm like, okay, I just agreed with him. I was like, okay, but if I agree with you, because there was no word, right, for protons and neutrons and electrons, up quarks, down quarks, muons, neutrinos. We didn't have any of that language. None of those words had been created yet to describe the inner universe. He's like, yeah. I'm like, so best definition of people 2,000 years ago or a bunch of sheep farmers is yeah, the, un the scene is made up of unseen stuff. It was about as much as you could get across. He's like, yeah, right, but it proves that the Bible predicted and had full knowledge of the way the world works. It's like, okay, I agree with you. That makes perfect sense. So here's what that means. It means it's a placeholder. That if we were to replace that, line, that phrase you found in the Bible, you would replace it with a physics lesson, right? You'd actually teach people about the protons and the neutrons, electrons, and you teach people that stuff. In the Genesis, instead of creating the heavens and the 
planets and then creating life. You, you, you go, you describe the Big Bang. He's like, yeah, I have no problem with the Big Bang because the Big Bang, you know, what came before the Big Bang had to be God. I was like, sure. I didn't get into the God of the Gap argument. I was just agreed with it. So sure, so you would replace the, the Genesis with the story of the Big Bang, how galaxies form. You'd be a cosmology lesson. So we right here, we're doing good. We've got... We've got a physics lesson, we've got a cosmology lesson, replacing huge important portions of the Bible. Oh, and uh, Adam and Eve, we could, we could do away with that, and we could replace that with, you know, uh, natural history. We could go with Darwin, origin of the species, add some genetics, a little bit of epigenetics in there. We could tell that story. No, 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 that's just a theory. I'm not really adamant about that. Because somehow that still had to be part of the story. He was like, well, that's just a theory, though. They even say it's just a theory. And I said to him, I was like, I was like, okay, either, either, two things are possible. Either you don't know what the scientific definition of the theory is, or you do know, and you're playing on a wordplay, assuming ignorance on my part of the difference between a scientific theory backed up by a lot of facts. And when some people casually use the word like it's a hypothesis or they're just guessing. People who have a religious ideology are willing to deceive. This person knows full well the difference of saying it's just a theory and the theory of evolution and what that means. But they're willing to tell anybody they talk to, well, they even say it's just a theory. That means they're willing to lie on behalf of proving their religion, which is ridiculous sentiment. But then I said to him, I was like, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing that puzzles me. If we're willing to agree that certain portions of the Bible are projecting, you know, the Genesis is the Big Bang, and this seen and unseen is the description of the Adam, and maybe natural history and evolution, maybe not, this is Adam and Eve, but doesn't every aspect of the Bible then require an updating a secular, scientific, or philosophical updating to where everything written in there is written for largely illiterate, meaning not that they just can't read, but meaning they haven't read anything else. That whatever information is being presented to them is the only things they've read. It's not like they're comparing it to anything else. Shouldn't we assume that any information in these books of ancient texts is really a placeholder that any wisdom has been expounded on. Any, any insights into the way the world works is better known today. Because so far what we've gotten to is three things that we've really delved into that are better explained by a scientific textbook than they are, the, than they are by the word of Man representing the word of God. Ridiculous propositions. <clears throat> Reach out with the bosons. Mm -hmm. We'll carry the force. You have to work tomorrow. I'll let you go. I, you look really bored with my conversation. I'm just tired. I'm sorry if we're talking all religiously. I need to do this more often now. I need to get into like more... I think you need to do it on, on not a science podcast, personally. Of course it needs to be on a science podcast. What better place to debunk religion? I mean, what better evidence is there that... Because well, this is... except... Okay, so, uh, Justin. Yeah. If you want to become mm -hmm. a science podcast that is more widely distributed, we can't really talk like this. I have to. I have to learn to not speak. But this you is the after show. This doesn't even go out on the show. It show. does though. Ooh. This this is on YouTube. On you. Who watches YouTube? It's the it's the podcast version people listen to. You'd be surprised. Really? How it's many just, people listen I'm to YouTube? I'm saying Chris Hardwick doesn't go off about religion all the time. Who's Chris Hardwick? I don't even know who. The Chris nerdist. Hardwick is. I don't even. Know. Oh, they're nerds. They don't go off about religion because they just don't have. Interaction with it. He had Bill Nye on his show like three times. Yeah, I would have Bill and Nye. Bill Nye on. talks about it a little bit, but like, if you want, if you want distribution, 
-hmm. in America, unfortunately, you have to be careful when you talk about religion. If we were in Europe, it'd be something else. Look at Ricky Gervais. But in this country, you have to be careful. You have to think like Jesus is in the mob. <laughs> and if you talk bad about Jesus, you know what? your you career know, will be the sleeping with is, the fishes. As if Jesus existed, me and Jesus would have way more in common than any Christian that's ever claimed oh, Christianity. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, but... No question. Yeah, no question. First of all, he and I would both be Jews. <laughs> right? Like, I'm down with Jewish people. I have Jew I have, you're my Jewish friend. So uh, I'm, that's, Jewish. I'm not a very good representative for that. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll have to do. You're my Jewish friend. Oi, Gabolt. I need a new black friend. Um, my, the, That's my black... not a great thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, my black friend got arrested again. He's going to be in prison for a while, so I need a new black friend. That was See, a racist joke. also, these that are was a racist joke. I have black friends. That you maybe should not be and saying. I have other Jewish friends, too. They will, uh, they will all vouch for the fact that I'm neither black nor Jewish. So we're not allowed. So this is also a problem. How can we not be having conversations of any shape or form at this day and age in America? Really? Because uh, it's America. Be, wait, no. But do you think there is? Do you not like have HBO or something? Like I've HBO is different. So we need a show on HBO. How do we get a show on HBO? Well, I do kind of wish I had had Isabella Rossellini's idea. That was, I think that was on HBO, or was it Showtime? Was, I forget. What was the show? Um, oh, I have to figure out what it was called. Uh, Insider says I should treat religion or ancient texts just like scientific texts now. I mean, you read Darwin on the origin of life nowadays, you forgive him his errors. Green porno. So That's what it was called. It was when she talked about animal sex. Nice. And she would dress up like the animal and like talk um, about it. Insider, what, so so you're talking about having a skeptical view towards religion the same way. It's not that you forgive. I don't. I'm not going to throw stones at religion to kill people. Okay, religious people to kill them for their beliefs. That's. But I would like it if, if their beliefs that they don't believe, they would take out the Sharpie and cross that out, as we do in science. If something in Darwin's origin of the species is found to be bullshit, we call bullshit, and whoever calls bullshit first, whoever, whichever one of us calls bullshit first... Okay, stop saying, say, stop swearing, we're going to get a mature rating on YouTube. Whichever scientist <laughs> calls blither blather on that uh, particular statement gets credit for being the one that called blither blather and getting it knocked out of the book of science if we had more people doing that with religion I think the religions would be much tighter the people could actually memorize their Bible because it would be get a lot of smaller we don't do we need that whole section is that your fault or the or the Christians fault the so and so begot so and so begot so and so begot so and so. Oh my God! It goes on forever. I don't know. I all this I'm list of you, names, I'm not a religious book of person. names. I've never read through the Bible all the way. You I've haven't? Read I've read it a few times. It's God. It's I've so read. Hard. I've read Genesis. Oh, I've read horrible. Ecclesiastes. I've read Job. I've read. I've read a few things here and there. I have never read the whole Torah ever. Yeah, it's really not. I don't worth need to. Doing. I don't need to. No, you don't need to. I mean, because you don't, you're not following in a belief system that has anything to do with the Torah. Well, I mean, a little bit, but not a whole. That a, culturally, though, it's not a. It's not a. Everything that I. Are you drinking to, as much as I'm drinking? By the way, I feel like. No, I've been drinking water. 
Oh, this is this is why our conversation isn't getting more fun. I had a concussion, okay? I drank one glass of wine with dinner and was drunk. <sighs> oh, wow. Because of the concussion. And so I actually drank a cup of coffee before I started this show so I could sober up. That's wild. I need to give myself concussions more often because I don't... I, I spend way too much on alcohol if concussions can make that more affordable then. Oof, I have to go to bed. Okay, good night. Sorry for... I'm ending the broadcast. Irritating you. <laughs> it's alright. All I, th I think we've hashed it out enough. I think we can put this one to bed for a we while. Can? We can? We can finally? You'll agree with me, finally. That there no, was no, I'm saying we can part ways on this discussion. I've told you what I think. It's not going to change until I get some sort of evidence one way or the other. And I don't think it matters what, like, I don't think it affects my actions in my day-to-day -day life. It doesn't affect any other beliefs that I have. I don't think it's hurting anybody. I, I'd be surprised, because you know where this whole conversation started? Where? When an Egyptian artifact was found in Israel. Okay. And you and you said maybe it was a gift to make know, up it was for enslaving joke. my people. It was a joke. Well, I'm. You just made a racist joke. I did. When? Yeah. When? You said your only black friend was in jail. He is. <laughs> Why? Not? That's not a joke. Why is that? <laughs> Oh, wow. Why is that why is that why is that funny? I think also you could make a joke about something that doesn't exist. Like I made a joke about inception today. That's not a real thing. I can't make it... jokes about things that people know about so I can reference them. I don't think just because I made a joke about the Egyptians enslaving Jewish people that that means that I believe that story 100% or even that I believe it at all. Oh, okay. Finally, thankfully, we've reached that point. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Oh, my God. If that's really where all this came from, that's very silly. No, that is where this started, though. That's yeah, no, it's where it started, but that doesn't mean that, like, it was the cause for a campaign. To save no, no, my I brain. wasn't trying to campaign about that. I was just uh, that's when I was like, yeah, but that never happened. And they're like, yeah, it was. It was like, and then we both looked it up, and I was like, yeah, no, 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 I'm right. And you're like, no, 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 I'm right. And then we started this other conversation. But that's where it started. Is like, it doesn't affect. Yeah, a way joke. It. Yeah, it's it just a joke. a joke. Yeah, it's just a joke. That didn't need to become a whole thing about the foundation of my existence and the foundation of your existence and whether or not there were Jews in Egypt. No, no, no. But, you know, it's it's funny, though. It's because... right now, with the tools that we have, it is impossible to know exactly what happened. Yeah, but we got a pretty good accounting if nobody else on the planet noticed two million people making a big exodus. And it didn't affect the economy, and it didn't affect... Economy? Huh? I mean, the Egyptian economy uh, didn't get massively affected by it. Like, there's no record of a quarter of a third of their population or whatever that would have been suddenly vanishing. And the whole idea that they were there to build the pyramids and the pyramids, it was just like I'm telling the same story again. And then the two kingdoms, uh, Judah and Israel, and they had different stories. Uh, it's, it's like it's... The thing that... The th reason it's a hot button with me is because it is a foundation story for the rest of the Bible. It's kind of... Uh, That's not really true. Kind of. Moses? Moses is not a foundation. Ten yeah, Commandments okay, is not so, a foundation. So the Ten Commandments are the foundation story. Icons know the before me. Whoa. The Thou Ten shalt Commandments... Not kill, not kill anybody Stop. who doesn't agree with that? The Ten Commandments is a foundation. 
Yeah. The exodus from Egypt is not necessary for the Ten Commandments. It's not? No. Oh. Why not? Exodus from Egypt is not necessary is for that, that story. I, All I that matters do... is that Moses was with the Jews somewhere, and he what brought do down this stuff from a burning bush. The Ten Commandments are not intertwined with Exodus. You can have Exodus, Exodus without the Ten Commandments, and you can have the Ten Commandments without Exodus. Why? How? No, that's when it happened. Lost in the desert. After they left Egypt. Yeah. God's like... Uh, if you take away Egypt, the Jews are in the desert. Okay. Mm. Sure. The whole freaking Middle East is desert. That's not hard to believe. No, no, not at all. Not at all. No, I'm not saying that. But That's I'm, what I'm, I'm saying. They're not, they're not uh, inseparable, those two stories. And the, found, the, and the exodus from Egypt is not required for all of the religious stuff in the Torah. It's not required. The, the whole value of that story is succumbing hardship and remaining a united people. That's it. And if you're religious, it means that, you know, God is looking out for the Jewish people, which a lot of people need to believe. Well, they're the chosen people. You can put it that way if you want, but a lot of people don't look at it that way. They look at it like Jews are targeted, and they're happy to have God on their side. Wait, what? And if that's what... Who's targeted? Jews. By who? Oh, by other cultures. Well, yeah, but like, you know. And so it helps them to know that in their opinion, God is looking out for the Jewish people. Yeah. That helps them. It doesn't matter to me. What's important to me is that the Jewish people have been through a lot, my ancestors have been through a lot, and we've made it through. That's all that matters to me. And that's what the whole story of Passover is to me. I don't dwell on any of the, and God said this, and God parted the Red Sea, that, all of that. That's a story. What's important to me is that our people have been through many hardships, and we have always remained. And there were many times when the Jewish people could have given up, assimilated, given in, done any number of things even disappeared off of the face of the planet completely, but they didn't. And that's I'm, what's I'm, important to me. I'm very glad for at least the amount of assimilation that is taking place, because if if you were speaking to me purely in Hebrew right now, this conversation would not have gone on very long. Okay, but you can say that, and I could say I'm glad that you're not speaking in Latin. Latin? I don't know how to talk Latin. I was born speaking English. So was I. Yeah. Um, so, in America. Yeah, I know. We're both in America. Right? This is why I love America. Because you have uh, a, a Roman Catholic uh, anti-theist and a Jewish atheist being able to carry on a conversation without, you know... Violence. But it's all but because it's because of the internet and you can't kick me in the shins if you're that far away. You your shins would be so bruised right now. <laughs> be black and blue. Yeah. Was it is isn't that like I mean I, I get the again the idea that being part of some kind of a culture, which I don't feel like I'm part of any kind of a culture. I but you are. Like I am. Am I? Definitely. Which one? Did you celebrate Christmas growing up? Yes. Did you ever go on an Easter egg hunt? Always. Did you ever go with a friend to church on a Sunday and knew what they were talking about at all? No, not really. That one... Not at all. No, actually, um, my grandparents used to take me to uh, St. Francis in downtown Sacramento, which is an there old brick, gothic-y kind of Catholic church. 
there. And they had the the phases of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like a bunch of these panels and this like relief statues about you know a couple feet high. These panels where they were showing the next step in the crucifixion. I remember thinking, is that what happens the rest of the week here? Like, is that some? Does that take place here? Like, do okay, they do that Okay, but you still you were people? in a church church before you went with a friend on a Sunday. You were in a church before growing up. Yeah. Also, your holidays that you celebrated as a family, mm -hmm. did you get those off of school? The holidays of like Christmas, started... like Easter. Did you get yeah, holidays? No, but not, no, we were we were completely secular at home, but we still did like the egg hunt and the present. Yeah, thing. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, how yeah, about yeah. did you every almost every day have to answer a question about your identity and what it was like to live in a Catholic household? I wasn't in a Catholic household though. That would be a misnomer. So, but, uh, but no, but that's what I'm saying. Did anyone ha ever ask you in intense detail what's it about like what Christmas, Christmas was? What yeah. it is like to celebrate Christmas. Yeah. And no. why do you have a tree? And who's Santa Claus? I don't understand. Yeah. No, nobody. Did you that. ever, at Christmas, not have a Christmas tree, walk into a store and go, do you have Christmas trees? And someone went, what's a Christmas tree? <laughs> no. This but is what I'm saying. But, you but are part I did of have a this community. Experience. That is supported have... in a nation where that is the majority. Mm, sort of, but I and also it is a different experience, experience yeah. growing up like that than growing up experiencing what I was just describing. Yeah, culturally, and that but not is religiously. Why culturally, no, this is what I'm saying. This yeah. is why culturally, Jews have this tradition where they talk about sticking together mm -hmm. as a community because sure. otherwise it gets very lonely and very, very difficult. So my best friend, uh, like this is like fifth, sixth, seventh grade, a couple many years. He was my best friend. Uh, Catholic kid. He goes to church on Sundays. I don't go to church on Sunday. I did for like until I was like four or five or something. The story I was telling earlier. And we're talking one day, and he explains he believes in God. And I'm like, really? That's weird. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, God does. What's God? Like, I don't even get it. He's like, well, God is always around. Like, I, you know, God's presence is always around us. I was like, okay, dude, we go to school together. We're in the same class. We spend, you know, seven hours in school. You and I, we're on a playground. We're playing it. There's no God. We hang out after school, like, three or four hours after school. So my assumption is, like, maybe God shows up, like, at the dinner table. But I've had dinner at his family. So no, God's not there. Like, where is he running into God? Like, I don't ever feel it or see it or think it. How has he got this God thing in his life when I'm around him all the time that he's awake? And I have a completely different experience. Of I don't have any inclination that there's any of this God thing. So uh, I sort of, I, I, I get the fact that the, cultural differences aren't there because we followed the basic holiday ritually stuff but no my nobody and there was no cross or Jesus in our household I mean you're gonna you're not you wouldn't have found the Bible but you would have found Nietzsche you would have found Socrates you would have found a lot of secular philosophers on the bookshelf. And and who are more art, much better at articulating uh, humanity, its position in this planet, and morality and everything else through you know Kant or whoever. Actually, I think Nietzsche is even a better moralist than Kant. But that's that. I mean, I came from a stupidly, just retardedly intellectual household that we did still do the. We did Thanksgiving too, you know, and it's not like we really were pro pilgrim. Right? <laughs> like hmm. Oh, the chat we still have a chat room here? I thought it was just you and us right now. Mm-mm. 
Well, they tell me the broadcast is going to end itself in five minutes, so we should probably sign out. All right. Until uh, until next week, you've been listening to this week in atheism versus anti-theism. <laughs> Tune in next week when uh, our subject will be virgins in the afterlife, holy communion. Is it actually the blood of Jesus? No. And <laughs> the menorah. Eight days? Come no. on. Eight days? No. It wasn't eight days. I know that. Come on. <laughs> You're just being silly now. I don't believe they wandered for 40 years either. I, I, I honestly, I honestly believe that <sighs> all of it, all of it, and I mean all of it, was written by writers who knew that their audience hadn't read anything else before, and they still failed to make it simple, direct, and then the, an original. It started with oral tradition, so it's like a game of telephone. It gets more complicated yes. and, and elaborate yes. with each new telling. Right. And it right. got told a hundred times before anyone put a pen to paper. Exactly. So it's wrong. We know it's incorrect. It's elaborate. It's elaborated. It's, 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 it comes from somewhere real, yeah. but what you're reading is not 100% the truth. Right. I never said it was. Right. No, no, no. Absolutely. And, and, and they could have given it God had come down. He could have given information to China, which was literate at the time. It had language. It had the written language. It was very literate language. But he didn't. He went to the illiterate and had him handed down as an oral tradition for 300 years until the very people who were responsible for the death of Jesus got to rewrite the Bible in however freaking form. Okay, uh, hold on. The form they wanted to. You're going to give me a whole other issue now. We don't have time to discuss this. No, oh, what? Which one? The Jewish people are responsible for the death of Christ. No, 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 no. You got me wrong. I was saying the Romans who were responsible for the death of Christ are the ones that got to write the story of Christ. Mm. That's what I was saying. Mm. It, was, it was the Romans who got... This, I mean, this is when, like, Jesus dies at Easter. Like, Jesus doesn't die well, at Easter. Well, was born on or, Christmas? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Which, I mean, this all got reinvented. Like, this is a constant reinventing that took place, that merged with other gods, that took other mythologies. I mean, there gets to be a point where there's almost nothing in the life and tales and stories of the Jesus character that doesn't borrow from multiple deity upon the earth stories. And the heavy anti-Semitism that really starts, because before it's an argument between a couple of Jews and occupying force, really takes place in, in Luke, the four to maybe even 500 years after the possibly an existence and death of Jesus, where Rome is having conflict with Israel again, and so there's a lot of anti-Semitic stuff that starts to show up as the Jews killed Jesus kind of a thing. So if you thought I was going into the, I was going to attack the Jews for having killed Jesus, um, no. That's not the... In fact, my family, this is what I think happened to my family. I think my family was Jewish. We heard that the Romans were embracing the idea of finally king of the Jews was going to be their god. Hey, this sounds great. It's going to be a nice day for Judaism in Rome, right? And we went there, and then it turned out, it's like, oh, but they put this twist onto it that was different than we, and we kept going. 
till we hit Sicily. There was a lot of. Uh, there You're was getting a lot cut of off real soon, dude. I know. Twelve Google's minutes. Gonna of cut you off. Here's the thing. We now have been talking Absolution for almost sin. four hours. I'm gonna double flip bird. I have been on Google Plus for four hours. Go to bed. Nobody's keeping you here. Yeah, I have to keep you. Broadcast. I can end the broadcast. Any, you've had the power the whole time. You can just hit the button. I'm too polite. All right, say good night. Absolution of sin. Say good night. Hey. There was night. no crucifix. Okay, good night, everybody. Night. Say the rosary tonight before bed. Hail <laughs> Mary, full of grace.